<laughs> Ian was patiently waiting backstage for me because patiently waiting and once the music started grooving along with the music grooving along with the music <laughs> uh yeah patiently waiting for me because that's how we end up working on this live stream a lot so well it's not like this was news to me though I know I mean, well it's never <laughs> well, you know what we've been we've been doing this for how we've long we've been doing um, this yeah also, I've got a, uh, I've got a drink. Can you guess what I've got as a drink? See, when you do this game, <laughs> I don't know if I should be shocked ever because you never really shock me. But then I, when I think that it's not horrifying, <laughs> what is it? It's a gimlet. Okay, you got to <laughs> okay. There you go. Good man. Good man. I've got a robot tie. Uh, oh, nice. I brought one of the robot jury to my office today and I brought the, the Canadian tie that Kristen made <laughs> and I put the Canadian tie on the robot and it's up in the, uh, it's up in the bookshelf. So yeah, it's how, been a week. I'm wondering how you're, uh, you know, how people at the office, you know, think about the jury and the, all of this. <laughs> well, um, my partner that I share the office with is most intrigued. And when I told her I was in a motion, she was like, wait, what? I said, like, yeah, they named me in the motion. Uh, it was. It was I funny. saw that. It, it was, was all, uh... it was, it was all in good humor. We, we had a good, we had a good laugh about it. And people, obviously my law partners are very forgiving of the fact that I was noticeably upset about being named in the motion. But yeah. What the frivolous BS on that motion. Uh, um, huh? It, uh, I don't know. I mean, I mean, do you and Mrs. Runkle share a brain? Yes. <laughs> Is that because it's her brain that's usually doing most of the executive functioning? Um, I I think it does all of the executive functioning. I do some other, um, you know, other stuff, but uh, we've uh, we've joked about having a unibrain since like way early in our relationship. Well, yeah, yeah. However, I do know that you, uh, I do know that, well, let's say that there was strife at the beginning of your relationship is, is interesting because people, I don't know if people know this story. I know this story. You've said this story that you met Mrs. Runkle by shooting her laser tag repeatedly over and over and over again <laughs> as she was back in the corner bit. because her pants had ripped. So, but we are back with trials of the century. So. To give us an introduction, Ian, who are you and why are you talking about historical trials? I am a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Um, I've got a channel, Runkle of the Bailey, which is um, all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, I cover a lot of Canadian cases, but all sorts of other things. We covered uh, Depp. We covered all sorts of things. But uh, I've also been nominated for the um, for the Gundies. Oh, that's right. Where is that nomination and link? Uh, I will have to grab Hang that. On. Um, if you Google the Gundies, um, what is it? Uh, the, um, what is it? Uh, so I've been nominated in two categories. One of them is most dapper, which I don't know. I about. agree with emphatically. <laughs> um, but the other category I was nominated in is, uh, best video. And the best video nomination is for my Get Ready With Me video, uh, which I'm like, okay, fair enough. That one was hilarious. Um, 
<laughs> it was kind of a throwaway joke, but it's uh, I'm, I'm pretty proud of it as throwaway jokes go. So let me see here. I've got to pull this up because I want to pin it to the chat. Uh, do, do, do. Where's the nomination link? I want the vote link. You were nominated, but where's the is the vote link active yet? Um, no, it's December first that uh, is when people the can voting start opens. Voting. Yeah. All right. So December first. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pin the uh, I'm going to pin the actual nomination for what I consider to be my one of my favorite videos of all time is your get ready with me video. Where, by the way, I'm working on a new Trials of the Century intro. And the get ready, get ready with me video. <laughs> you getting out of bed and parading around the house with uh, a certain firearm and a hot sauce dispenser at the front of it. Um, that one is is going to contribute some clips to that video uh, or that intro video once I get it. Once <laughs> I'm up and running. Just me taking a, a sip off hot sauce. Um, the other fun thing about the. Um about that one is if you watch it and all of the moments with hot sauce are straight up like there was no fakery it was just so everything you see me doing with hot sauce i did with a hot sauce so yeah it, it's um, moving too fast hang on <laughs> chat's moving too fast chat's moving there it is Wait, catch you know the chat's moving fast when i have to catch my own comment <laughs> There we go. For those of you who don't know what the Gundies is, the Gundies is an award uh, that's awards that are given out every single year to content creators that focus on the Second Amendment. Ian himself, uh, being a Canadian, doesn't get to um, operate under the Second Amendment that we have in the U.S. However, has a lot of commentary on the safe and lawful use of firearms. And while firearms can be scary to a lot of people, they don't have to be, and they really shouldn't be when they're appropriately managed, used, and handled. And Ian does a lot of content talking about government intervention in that fundamental right um, and does it from a very, very, I, I would say you you border on satire sometimes, but then get very serious with the subject matter. I mean, sometimes you have to laugh in order to keep from going nuts. Um, yeah. Yeah. So please go check out Ian's channel, Run Cold the Bailey. And also, if you wouldn't mind, just click that link in the in the pin to comment and then star that favorite that because when they open the nominations or they open the voting, I want to make sure that I get perhaps the opportunity to join Ian in Las Vegas this year, not as his guest because he's going to try and bring his wife, but to celebrate with him when he is ultimately uh, awarded I suspect victor. She's, I suspect she's going to hear, you know, um, going for a gun event. No, thanks. She might be like, I want to go to Vegas. That I could see her being all about, but uh, I suspect she'd just be like, I'm just going to give the rest of this a miss. Terry LaBeth, uh, no hot sauce was harmed in the Get Ready With Me video. Um, <laughs> no, it was, but Ian was when he put the hottest hot sauce he could on his face. Yeah, um, I'm just going to say right now, I do not recommend doing that. Um <laughs> The regret that I saw on your face in a micro expression <laughs> was pretty significant. <laughs> oh, I could feel it. And um, it was, this was a bad idea from the very beginning. Yeah, I could definitely feel it. So. Yeah. Uh, so that's you. So I'm my name is Rob. Uh, I'm not quote unquote Rob. I am Rob. That is my actual name, Rob. Um, and the channel name is Lawn Lumber which if you're here, you know that. Um, I'm an attorney that practices in Virginia, uh, the U.S. attorney practicing in the area of domestic relations litigation. I'm a trial attorney, and I love trials. I love the theater of the courtroom, and I always have since I started practicing. Didn't think I would, but I did. Um, and I've been doing that for more than 13 years now, which is getting scarier the, the longer it keeps on going and those numbers keep ticking up. Um, but... Like I said, courtroom provides for great theater. We've given commentary on trials that are existing today, but I approached you a while back, a long time ago, back to be, to be heard, with the idea that I had of covering some of these historical trials, these trials that were really impactful in the U.S., um, British, and Canadian systems. We've covered Australian trials. 
trials that are very significant and have um, laid foundational principles for trials to come throughout history. So that's who I am. That's who Ian is. That's who we are. Ian's a little under the weather today. He already asked me beforehand. He goes, we can do this, but you're going to carry a lot of the weight because <laughs> Ian's, uh, he's about 60% as he so graciously elaborated. I see crits in the chat, legal vices in the chat. I think Dr. Dr. Joe Co Corcoran's in the chat. So oh, everyone's cool. here. One, uh, uh, people are saying hashtag pen. I saw that he, uh, he started up a channel and good for him. Legal vices. Legal Vices is there is a certain participant to this particular trial that is one of my all time favorites. Ian, you know who that is. Oh, yes. <laughs> Clarence Darrow and Clarence Darrow delivered one of the best closing arguments of all of history in this particular trial. That was not a trial. Well, this seems to be a trend right now. Last one we did was a trial without a trial. And the thing is, is like. You know, Clarence Darrow delivered a great closing is kind of it's kind of one of those headlines that just eh. it's it's a little obvious if that makes sense. Um yeah. Clarence Darrow was a gruff. He was, I would say, he is the embodiment of a lot of defense counsel. He he kind of laid the groundwork for what defense attorneys eventually became. Oh, the, the number of uh, the number of defense lawyers who wish that they were Clarence Darrow is all of them. Uh, and I would say the number of plaintiffs counsel that wish they would never go against Clarence Darrow is all of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, except for Robert Crow. Robert Crow and he were kind of arch nemeses. They didn't care for each other. Uh, very fascinating. But let me see if I can't find. I'm just gonna pull a clip. Give me a minute, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull this. It's kind of funny. I talked to a prosecutor who was like, "Oh yeah, no, Clarence Darrow's my hero," and I was like, "You know, he was a defense lawyer, right?" <laughs> he he had not done his homework on that particular fact. Well, I mean, he can still be your hero. He's a damn good litigator. But litigated the Scopes Monkey trial, uh, Sacco and Vanzetti, I think, was him as well. So Clarence Darrow has been a staple in American jurisprudence since American jurisprudence was American jurisprudence. Um, and uh, Legal Vice is in the chat noting, uh, he's saying, and yet he was poor. I'm like, yeah, Clarence Darrow, I think, took on a fair number of trials just because they needed to be run. Like, I... And I, I've done that, where you just take on a trial because it's like, well, somebody's got to help this person. I'm somebody. Let's do it. Um, I, I have some. There's someone in the chat I need to call out. Um, Niklas. Niklas, <laughs> who is a uh, he is a union rep and labor attorney. Um, and he called me out yesterday and last night because I had not compensated the robot jurors. And. Now I have a problem and a bone to pick with Niklas because they have voted to unionize. So I now have a robot jury union that I have to deal with. Collective Here's bargaining. The problem is that jurors aren't entitled in most places to form a union or to engage in collective bargaining. Their pay is usually They're... dictated by statute. And well, um, do you want to make the motion for me? Like you can do that because they're saying they're paid actors. I mean, if they're a jury, then then no. But they should have the right to not be on camera. However, you got to uh, you got to get a shade to cover them. They're blurred. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we get in? Why don't we get into the subject of this evening's uh, discussion, which is in fact the trial of Leopold and Loeb? Look at this very pretty slide deck. This slide deck um, was created by two of my channel moderators and channel moderators that you share as well. Um, the forefront of the creation of slide deck was uh, Lady Draconis. So if you see her in the chat, thank her because she did a ton 
ton of work on this particular slide deck, pulling images, going to primary sources and finding information. It was really amazing what she was able to pull together based on our prequel to this um, just a few, well, I guess it's months ago. Uh, and I guess that I should probably do a discussion on formatting. So Trials of the Century, we had done a series and had issues in the past. So we're now we're recreating a lot of those. And under this new format, what we will do from time to time, based on our availability, is we will do a members-only live stream to members of Runkle of the Bailey and Law and Lumber. We'll do a members-only live stream where we're going to preview and go through our notes and create the notes for the eventual show. So keep an eye on that as it comes out when those members only gets announced because you get to see Ian and I go down 19 million rabbit holes to try and plan a more coherent discussion like this evening during the live show. And that was Rob and I both agree. Like we don't want anybody to miss out. And so, you know, at least on the legal education aspects of things. So like all of the uh, trials of the century continue to just be available for, like just for whoever, right? Um, that's yep. for everybody. But, you know, the behind the scenes and the behind the scenes is us, you know, if you're, if you've seen the meme of the guy with like the crazy uh, pegboard with like all the pictures on it and, and the string and, you know, the conspiracy theory face, um, that's really what that's about. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's trying to take a trial that happened several decades ago, digest it, process it, gather the relevant information of what we need to convey about the trial, what we have to add to the trial, get chat engagement, questions they want to hear, and then, you know, recuperate and, and put it all together and throw it throw it in the slide deck. So that's that's what we've got going on this evening. That's the trial for this particular episode is the trial of Leopold and Loeb. So if you are a member, if you were gifted one of the memberships uh, on either Ian's channel or my channel, you can go to that lovely tab in YouTube. That's the membership tab, and it will give you access to those videos. You can go back and watch the prep streams and the, the neurodivergency uh, manifest <laughs> in all of its glory. And I am being reminded that... Um, Today is a very special day for Kristen M96, who created the bots. She's the creator of the bots. She has not been named union leader for the bots, but she was the creator of the bots. And today is her birthday. So happy birthday, Kristen. All right. So Leopold and Loeb. So Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb. These were two characters and the individuals that are depicted on the screen, I think were 19 and 18 at the time that this photo was taken. They might've been 20 and 19 at that time, but they were relatively young. And the time and place of this particular incident took place in Chicago, Illinois, just outside of Chicago in a very wealthy area of Chicago, Illinois in 1924. So take yourselves back to 1924. Now the demography of the area is really interesting. And so is the socioeconomic status of the two individuals that were primary players. What was happening in 1984? This is what I'm saying. Kristen Nin is, uh, yeah. 1924. I think you just said 1984. Not 1984. That's a different, that's a, that's a book and a different decade. Also the year I was born. So yeah, <laughs> 1924. So to bring you back to the news of things that were happening during that period of time, January 24th, Vladimir Lenin died. Uh, 25th, the first Winter Olympics game opened in Chamonix, France. Okay. Uh, this one's great. So this was the original publication of Happy Birthday to You on March 4th of 1924. Oh, I hate that song. Everyone does, especially when it's sung to them. Oh, man. But, I, uh, I remember at one point I was at a, uh, you know, at uh, some, it was a birthday for me, and you know I could, and somebody went and talked to the wait, like the waitress, and I was like, oh god, they're setting this up, and I was just like, so I just like I gotta go to the bathroom, and I got up and I went to the waitress, and I'm like, I know you guys have probably been told to sing happy birthday to me. If you do, I'm leaving, <laughs> and they're like, what? And I'm like, 
I I'm just gone. Like I will get up and walk out. Do not do that to me. And they're like, understood. So they came by and they're like, so we're not singing the song, but you know, here's a dessert. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> and now you see why we have slides. Yes, because <laughs> otherwise we have tangents. We still have tangents, but uh... we still do. Uh, April 17th, 1924, Metro Pictures, Goldwyn Pictures, and Lewis Mayer Company merged to create MGM. MGM was created in 1924. April 18th of 1924, the first crossword puzzle was published by Simon and Schuster. Oh, that's and impressive. Then, I know, right? And then in May 4th, this is the one that got me, was they used to run, I forgot this, they used to run the Summer and Winter Olympics the same year. They didn't offset them. Imagine trying to pull that off now. <laughs> I mean, now it's just become such a corporate, you know, gong show that... Uh... Yeah. Yeah, but you would have ads. You think about this. You have ads for the uh, the Summer Olympics during the Winter Olympics if it was today. Would they be in the same location? Ooh. That's tough. That's tough. Um, I don't know. But before moving on, Legal Vices says, fun fact, in a, in a maritime case about the vessel Essex, Darrow made an appearance to argue against extradition to Illinois for one client and ended up getting charges against all defendants dismissed. I've done that where you, um, where you end up defeating the case against everybody just by, um, just like by your arguments. Um, the judge in my case threw a, threw shade at the other counsel because it was really not so much that I'd done a great job. It was that the other lawyer had dropped the ball and nearly convicted this client when he didn't need to be. And he was just like, so we heard a lot of arguments in this case and Mr. Runkle made some good ones or something along those lines. And I was like, Oh man. Um, it's a rare but, occurrence. The fact that he got Ian that excited, it's a rare occurrence indeed. Uh, and then Nick Loss comes in and says the young thug trial might be a future trial of the century. I don't know. That's going to be jury selection of the century after a six to nine month planned trial became a mistrial after three days because law and crime camera guy showed five jurors faces. <laughs> I am tomorrow. I want to have a rant and a half about uh, the filming that's happened. Um, oh, it's pretty bad. Well, the uh, the Paltrow trial, I was raging the entire time because they're sitting there going, like the judge has said, hey, um, you can't film the jurors or you can't film the uh, the people. And, you know, and yet they were focused on like Paltrow's face, notwithstanding the direct court order against it. And then the Maya trial where it was just like, oh, look, let's zoom in on Maya. And it's like, you know, she's not talking. She's not anything. It's just, you know, grief porn. Oh, that, that ticked me off. And now we're seeing the results of that with the Koberger trial where they're like, we're going to film this, but not you guys. It's going to be the court filming this because you guys can't be trusted because you go against our orders. So, yep. And then these, these companies are going to be like, why does this happen to us? Well, and if I was one of these judges and they were like, hey, we're coming in, I'd be saying, okay. Um, you guys need to know, here's the rules. You do not film these following people. If this happens, I'm going to be holding like the representative from, you know, law and crime, court TV, whoever it is, um, accountable, but also mm -hmm. you camera person. Um, I will personally like lock you up. You specifically will go to jail over this. And so, um, if you don't, um, what is that? Um, if you aren't um, careful about this, then yeah, you'll go to jail. Yep. So, uh, and for those of you in the chat, can someone start keeping count of the different rabbit holes? Like just I, personal reasons. Uh, May 10th of 1924, J. Edgar Hoover was named the head of the FBI. Okay. And his reign was supreme for quite some time. May 17th, Black Gold wins Kentucky Derby. June 2nd, Calvin Coolidge signs the Indian Citizenship Act, which declares all Native Americans to be American citizens. October 15th, Statue of Liberty declared a national monument. 
a gift from the French. November 27th was the first Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade held in New York City. Now, that's the U.S. Thanksgiving, which you were so kind to remind me of last week when I was saying, Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. You were like, it's not for me. <laughs> um, okay, so that's historically what was occurring during that period of time. Now, who were Leopold and Loeb, and where did they come from? They came from a lot of money, a whole lot of money. To give you an example, this was the home of Loeb. This was the Loeb household outside of Chicago in a very wealthy suburb. And so they had a very privileged upbringing. They both did. Um, hang on one second. Get to my notes. All right. So Richard Loeb's dad was the vice president of Sears Roebuck. And actually, they were wealthy enough to hire a governess to assist in the upbringing of their particular children. Uh, both of them had governesses. Now, there's some allegations that the relationship between Richard Loeb and the governess might not have been uh, entirely up, uh, you know, right. Um, but Richard Loeb was very bright from a very young age. He loved, just like his compatriot, Nathan Leopold, he loved crime novels, history novels and historical crime novels. We and don't know anybody like that, right, chat? None. <laughs> yeah. So he was well more intelligent than his years. And he was, like I said, very affluent, very affluent upbringing. He had the best of all that society could have offered back then. Leopold, not far off. Nathan Leopold, likewise, um, very, very wealthy upbringing, also of similar intellect, but not really as applied when it came to his academics. Nathan Leopold was the bad boy. Richard Loeb was the intellect. Nathan Leopold was the, uh, everyone liked him, everyone loved him. He was the, the talker. Richard Loeb, not so much. And you can start to see the foundations of how this friendship started to amass. So he was born of a millionaire box manufacturer who basically gave him everything that he, he wanted. <laughs> By the age of 18, he could speak nine or 10 languages. That was pretty impressive. That was a fact that I wrote down. Nine or ten That's languages. impressive. That's way more than I can speak. You can speak French like a master. I can, but, well, not like a master. I can speak French like a, um, you know, a slightly inept and maybe a little bit drunk child. But, um, you know, I can speak French enough to, to survive. And this is the home of young Bobby Franks. Now, Bobby Franks is the ultimate victim of this particular incident. And Bobby Franks was, I think, 14 years of age at the time. He was, um, so the district they lived in was, they all lived in the same district, Hyde Park District in outside, outside of Chicago. And Bobby Franks was also remarkably bright and remarkably academic in, well, he was, a de he debated a lot. And we'll get to what he was the subject of his debates as we get to the actual trial itself. Mm -hmm. So Nathan Leopold, this is the picture of the young man himself, uh, born 1904 and died August 29th of 1971. I think that I just kind of went past the whole, did they get the death penalty or not? Because died in 1971 means no. But... And then this is Richard Loeb. And this is one of these cases that people are like, well, what about the death penalty for really awful people? And I'm like, I don't think that they need to. Um, I don't think that the death penalty was needed here. Um, so, yeah. But you can already kind of tell in their affect in just these two images how these two individuals differed, but were similar. Um, born around the same time, both young, very intelligent, thought they were smarter than the whole world, 
loved each other well were impassioned with each other um there was some debate over that one there was there was there was definitely an affection by one towards the other but whether that was reciprocal we don't know bobby franks uh ian would you mind reading this one real quick the young bobby franks would you mind reading the slide real quick wait a second so September 19th, 1909, uh, through to May 21st, 1924. How old does that make him? Um, not that old. Uh, son of Chicago millionaire Jacob Franks, uh, cousin to Richard Loeb, student at Harvard School for Boys, victim of the attack. Interesting fact, member of the debate team and debated against the deba uh, death penalty. Now, of course, when you're on the debate team, you typically get... Um, uh, you typically get assigned the, um, what is it, uh, whatever position you're on. So that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the one you believe in. So, yeah, I mean, it, it may or not be, may or may not be actually his position or not, but um, it is what it is. Um, the timing of it was very interesting to me, though. So the timing of the debate it ended up being, I think, several weeks before he was actually kidnapped in this particular crime. So, but that's the young Bobby Franks, as he is remembered. I love this. So, people today, and people will criticize me for this, like the body language artists. Well, there's a lot of psychoanalysts out there as well who love to analyze the psychoses of true crime and well people who commit these heinous crimes a lot of that began and got a lot of popular influence around this time with this particular trial so there was a lot of focus here about their psychological backgrounds they both very very much were obsessed with crime they loved something about the control of it. Like, it, just very interesting. So if the psychological analysis of these two individuals was at the forefront of this particular trial. And they, they thought it was going to be on display during the trial to try and prove their guilt or innocence because everyone believed they were going to try and plead insanity. Which, I mean, insanity wouldn't have gone anywhere. Like, it just wouldn't yeah. have. But these were actual images that were uh, essentially offered they were intended to be offered as exhibits as exhibits so uh as you can see this were, one two were these alienists. for exhibits or just for like news coverage i know so they're summarizing what the experts would have testified to i don't know if they intended them actually as exhibits but i do know that they were clipped and they're in newspaper clippings from this time so i don't know if they intended them as exhibits but the alienists so if you see the bottom there um this is what they intended to testify to Two alienists, which we called psychiatrists, like forensic psychiatrists, for the defense, after study of Richard Lowe, found that he was the mastermind in the slaying of Robert Franks. Picture diagram illustrates a phrenologist finding made public at the time of the boy's confession. So this was a finding that was being made public at that point in time. Look at this. They're looking at the nose, the, the, the angle of the nose, the actual um, makeup of the human body as suggestive of criminal misgiving pretty wild to think about talk about prejudgment well i mean the problem with phrenology is that you could do all of these things in a great way to uh what is it um you know when you've got when you already know the answer right when you already know the uh the solution the problem is that phrenologists are actually just completely awful at predicting who's actually going to be a criminal. So you can come up with an explanation of like, this guy's head shape means he's a criminal when you already know that. But if you give them a dozen people, they're not going to have any predictive value at actually telling you who will be a criminal um, unless they already know. Right. And, and so, yeah, I know. It's isn't this, isn't this wild? Like they, they look at the tip of the nose. The tip of the nose shows aggressiveness or 
it shows feminine nature in the nose. Like, really? Loeb, this is Leopold. That's what we're going to go off of? But it's because it shows how they whatever want they, the they feel like, right? It just, um, that's, that's the nature of these sort of BS pseudosciences. Um, so self-confirming, you would say? Yeah, I mean, um, and I know you might disagree, but um, you get the same thing with um, like body language analysis where it's like, oh, yeah, we say that, you know, this this sign shows that the person's lying. It's like, yeah, the question is, can you do it when you don't already know? And the answer to that is typically no. Um, when people don't know, they do worse than chance. But um, so. Yeah, it's um, it's the problem with anything where you already know. It's astrology, basically. It is. Now, yeah. to give you an idea of their relative intellect, they were very far advanced compared to their peers. So Leopold, Nathan, graduated from the University of Chicago at the age of 18 years of age. University of Chicago, 18 years of age, graduate college. Richard Loeb graduated from the University of Michigan at the age of 17. So college degrees before they hit their 20s. And do you think, the thing is here, do you think that that advanced intellect, well, never mind, we'll get to that in a minute. Because I, see, my brain is wanting to go down a little intellectual rabbit holes, but I know the slide deck is supposed to keep me focused and there and, and, aimed at a particular goal for a particular moment. So my brain is trying to resist the organization of the slide deck. And I'm trying to behave. Pre-planning. Now, if you were going to try and commit what they believed to be the perfect crime, what would you do? I mean, they already screwed up. They killed a kid with money. Yeah, I starting but point. They didn't, <laughs> you know, that's pick your victims appropriately. Yep. Now, um, a, a lot of this was fantasy. You remember you remember reading about this one where they they kind of looked at the books and they they were creating an amalgamation of the various things they had read in these true crime novels or these crime novels and they wanted to create what they thought was the perfect crime that that was uh, they weren't going to get caught like these idiots in the novels. They were smarter than them. Oh, and they um, they were so not. I wonder if they actually felt bad later, like sitting back and looking at the like at the crime and just being like, wow, we sucked at this. Like we really, really sucked at this. Um, Because they did, they sucked really hard at the whole perfect crime thing. They did, but they loved the they loved the crime element. And Richard Loeb himself, I mean, when these two met, okay, good. I'm looking at the slide deck and the chronology. I can go back for a second. When these two met, what was it? It was said of what's that famous quote? Uh, Richard Loeb loved crime. Nathan Leopold loved Richard. Something like that. Richard Loeb had engaged in a lot of criminal activity. Stealing. Uh, carjack. Not carjacking. What we call it. Joyriding a lot. They would pick up a random car on the street. These were the cars that existed back in the day before any of the locks were fancy. You could just get in a car and it was pretty easy to get it moving and running. So you get the car I, running and you take it for a joyride. I think at this point it might have actually been that they didn't have security systems at all. Like I think it's so just a matter right. of, uh, you know, you just get into a car and it drives. Yeah. So they would go on joyrides. They would commit different thefts. Um, famously, they they broke into the fraternity at the University of Michigan and stole a typewriter. Yes, it was Michigan. 
stole a typewriter. They drove several several miles, hours to get there to steal that typewriter, break in the typewriter that they eventually used in this particular I was going to say, incident. how did that work out for them? It didn't work out very well. But Richard Loeb, as a lot of individuals of a younger age without really much guidance, this is Clarence Darrow talks a lot about this in other cases. What drives people to crime? Actually, you know what? I'm going to do this. Let me pull the slide slideshow down. Because I want to share. Yeah, I should get this up. Let's hear Clarence Darrow talk about it in his own his own words. Ooh. Because it's very rare that we actually get to hear one of these individuals communicating with us. So this is uh, Clarence Darrow making an argument. I don't think it was this particular case, but Clarence Darrow talking about the foundation of crime. Most people think there is no cause for crime except the pure trustedness of the one they call a criminal. <laughs> As a matter of fact, there's a cause for everything in this world. And there's no way to remove the evil without removing the cause. There's a cause for all sorts of human conduct, just exactly as there's a cause for all the physical action of the universe. The real cause of crime is poverty, ignorance, hard luck. And generally you. These almost invariably combine to produce what we call a crime. When we look at the prisoners in the jail, we find that all of them practically are poor. At least Which is true. Men. And these have always been poor. At least nine tenths. For those of you complaining about the fact that this is uh, choppy and the audio is cutting here and there, that is oh, not do my we not doing. have the uh, do, we, do we not have the best video from the twenties? This is <laughs> this is before the invention of four K. This is how we actually watch this stuff. This is how people watch this stuff back then. Um, so this is this is to give you a manner of Clarence Darrow. And how he argued. Look at look at everything about this man. Like when I said gruff and direct and to the point, he didn't play around. So he's sitting there in that posture and he's he's right up, he's lecturing. I could you imagine the confidence of an attorney these days walking into a courtroom, taking that posture in front of a jury and just lecturing like that and having the confidence to say all of those things. I mean, there's a reason why he was like the goat. Um. So, but he's giving, he's giving a lot of insight that's still very applicable today. Many people are driven to crime because they're poor. They don't have the upbringing that would, that would kind of bring them to that. Um, that would, sorry, I'm getting distracted here. They don't have the upbringing that would, well, they have, they do it out of need, necessity, or they don't have anything else. So that people, is the vast, vast majority. And correct. Um, and these two young men that we're talking about today are not in that category. They're very different, which is very interesting as to why and how Clarence Darrow gets involved in this case. But let's, let's keep, because he keeps going. And what they call a criminal career as mere children, 11, 12, 13, at a time of life when the ways of life are fixed. Nine tenths of them also are ignorant. They've never had the training that every intelligent parent would think was necessary to keep their child out of prison 
and make him safe in the community. I want to pause there because this has significance in this particular trial as well. One of the things we're going to talk about is that you might have superior intellect. These two individuals, uh, Leopold and Loeb, both had superior intellect. They were very intelligent, but they were not wise in the ways of the world. They had not lived enough years to have the human experience, which is what Clarence Darrow is talking about here. They're ignorant in the ways of the world. They don't understand and they can't process that what they're doing, while it seems logical to them, they have not lived enough years to realize the error in their own logic. All these things almost universally combine to put people in jail. The story of the so-called criminal is simple. He generally comes from a poor home. Orphan, half orphan, our parents who can do nothing for him. He's generally oh, we'll do nothing for him. less yep. intelligent than those who have a better chance. He either had no chance to go to school or else he did not care to go to school. And our schools are not fitted to give anyone a training unless it's the old line of training which only fits one for profession. Most of them that finally get their place in jail have no taste for books, but they could take manual training. They could prepare themselves for trades or occupation. And the man of the trade or an occupation is seldom found in prison. And to hard time produce crime. Boys and men will steal when times are hard, who never would steal if they had a chance to make a living in some other way. What we need is a patient, humane understanding of the problem and a treatment such as physicians would give to the ill. And if that was done, we could get rid of crime, but we never can get rid of it by cruel punishment and rendering boys hopeless and helpless. And the only, was the only thing in life, the commission of another crime. Mr. Darrell. Now, isn't that remarkably fascinating? Because Here's one thing, Ian. How many of those things that he was saying could be applicable today? I mean, all of that is true today, like 100%. Um, and people are like, oh, you know, you can't solve uh, problems like by throwing money at them. I'm like, if I had money to throw at people, um, I could absolutely solve the vast majority of crime. Now, that isn't all of it. But, you know, um, because there's an there's an exception to what he's saying, which I think is really interesting, is this particular case. And, and this is a question for you. This is a he weird case out. because it's so yeah. weird that you actually see somebody who's got um, all of these resources, all of these assets um, committing a crime like this. Um, it's just very strange it and you made never happens comment. you made the comment of if you had all the money in the world you could stop all the crime but the, but then you appropriately most of the, the crime caveat. yeah you, you appropriately add the caveat where sometimes the money doesn't help the issue yeah and when you have these two young men who have been told throughout their entire lives that they are superior to their common man to their peers they are superior in intellect they are they are above their intellectual peers you have that and then you have 
no familial backbone. You don't have wisdom being conveyed. All you have is money being thrown at the kids. Yeah, and I mean, you know, that's the problem with like raising kids in this kind of absentee fashion. Um, they develop their own morality. They develop their own notions, and um, which, which may not be good ones. And that's another fascinating thing about this particular trial and this particular crime in itself is, you know, people want to, what Darrow is arguing is the nature and nurture argument. And someone in the chat I saw earlier very appropriately surmised that Darrow lands smack dab in the middle of it. He hasn't picked a side one way or the other. Is it nature? Is it nurture? He hasn't chosen a side. What he's saying, though, is that a lot of the things that uh, correlation is not causation, but correlation is something. You can't just ignore it. And when you've got all of the people that are in jail and a vast majority of them are in this camp, there's got to be a way that you can attack those root causes. You've got to be able to try and fix that. But as people in the chat also pointed out, there's a significant mental health push portion of this trial. And it becomes more significant as the trial starts to progress. And there's a question about the mental health and, and what were the psychoses, the psychology of these two young men? Was that created by their nature? Was it created by their nurture? Or is it, a, is it a, some amalgamation of the two? And I think Darrow argues it kind of straight down the middle of it's a little bit of both. And I think if you had played this back to Darrow, he probably would have raised, and I think it's probably evidence of the fact, if you had played his own words back to him, Darrow probably would have raised his hand and says, but wait, there's another class, like other than these individuals that are the downtrodden that, that submit to crime, there's another class of individuals who find themselves engaged in crime because there's an element of it that's been bred in not bred into them, but you get told you're the, special your whole life. Yeah. Go ahead. The best evidence is that it is a mixture of genetics, but also, um, also nurture. And the thing is, is like most of the like serial killers and so forth. Um, people are like, Oh, you know, they're, um, they're just like born evil and whatever. Most of them actually have a background where you're like, Oh, um, okay. That's pretty messed up. Um, and one thing I will address because it gets raised a lot. And this one's a peeve of mine. Uh, people will talk about, um, the, uh, what is it? I forget what they call it. The, uh, the trifecta of symptoms. Um, what is it? Uh, that is, um, like bedwetting fire setting. And, um, what's the other one? Um, I'm trying to remember what it is now. Um, yeah. And, you know, people call it like the dead, you know, the dark triad, the deadly triad, etc. I will tell you, it has zero predictive effect. Um, and what I mean by that is that, um, if you look at people who have, oh, and, uh, animal cruelty, if you look at people who have those, uh, those symptomologies, it does nothing to predict in the future whether or not they're going to be violent um, at all as compared to people with other similar traits. Um, it is something that is found retrospectively if you look at serial killers, i.e. once you know somebody's a serial killer, they're more likely to have had those traits. But um, there is one thing that that triad predicts very strongly. Hmm. which is it predicts very strongly if you see a kid with those symptoms that that kid is being abused very badly or has been abused very badly. And so that whole dark triad thing, and this is a rant of mine because it resulted in a bunch of kids getting basically written off as like, this kid is a future psychopath. This kid is a future violent, you know, whatever. And what it meant is that a bunch of people who were 
abuse victims got flagged as potential serial killers, notwithstanding the fact that there was no evidence in that direction. And basically ended up blowing up their lives worse than it had already been blown up. You've got people who are sitting there who are, you know, victims of horrific abuse, because that's really what, you know, creates those uh, symptoms. And then they're cut off from getting help because people have decided they're they're a pro-criminal. Um, it is one of the biggest shams and one of the biggest, um, like, atrocities that we've wreaked through all of that. So um, that one is a rant I will go on because it's a um, it um, it it's something that makes me rage. They identified some of the most vulnerable people in society and singled them out to be viewed as um, as super dangerous. Um, well, and it's a rant that has an appropriate home in this case because there are allegations that one or both of these children were subjected to things they should not have been subjected to at a young age. And whether that manifested in, in their development, we don't know. We don't have the, you can speculate all you want, but we don't know. What we do know is that they, they found each other, both of them. And they, they kind of, you want to talk about a perfect storm of individuals that could feed off the worst negativity that the other one would give. And that's these two, um, you know, Richard Loeb was thrilled with crime. He loved the idea. He was, a, he was a, a remarkable student of Nietzsche, Frederick Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, sorry. And the idea that, there are those that are superior to others and that the rules are different for those individuals and they should be. And he viewed himself in that light. And, and Nathan Leopold, of course he did. Like everybody yeah. who's got that notion, um, nobody's ever like, Oh yeah, there's, you know, these superior individuals and I'm not one of them. So I better like, you know, cozy up to those people. Like it's always like, and I am the superior, like, what, what, what you yeah. said is, I'm not one of them, so I should cozy up to those people. You've just described Nathan Leopold. Nathan Except Leopold. He thought he was one of them. He, he but just... he thought he was, but he'd never really, he thought he was, but he was always socially awkward. He was never the person who could command a room. And he was on the same intellect. I mean, Nathan Leopold was no, he was remarkably intelligent in his own right. I mean, Leopold was, he was an ornithologist at this age. He was and considered one of the nation's leading ornithologists on a particular bird at the age of 17 or 18. Also, speaking of terrible human beings, um, Henry Kissinger apparently just died. Oh. <laughs> no breaking yeah. news, Ian. <laughs> um, but you have this gravitational pull that these two have towards each other. And they bring out the worst in one another. And, you know, this is what the testimony was going to reveal. This is what a lot of the evidence was revealing, was that there was a sexual nature to that relationship that was perhaps an element of manipulation by one of the boys against the other, by Loeb against Leopold. Whether that, that's, again, it's speculation. Now, there's some of it that's actually, that's, that is testified to by both of them. Um. But how did they become who they are or who they were back then? We don't know. Yep. We, it's, it's tough. So let's get to the actual plan. Subtle break-ins and little thievery wasn't enough. You know, there's a point in time in a lot of criminal activity where rubber meets road, right? Um, <laughs> you are doing a lot of the the pettier crimes, the stealing, the non non human violent, and then there's a decision, there's a, a inflection point. 
Some people don't go voluntarily. They just find themselves in the circumstance where their, their criminal activity tends to violence. Some people seek it out. Richard Loeb was in the latter category. He sought it out. And Leopold did as well. They both sought out the intentionality. They wanted to increase the severity of their criminal activity. So they get to planning the perfect crime. I mean, now, they wanted to take it to max, basically. Like they do, you know. Sorry, Ian. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Oh, they, I mean, they're just like this dial goes up to eleven. Because yeah. murder was a necessary element of their thing. Whatever their next criminal activity was going to be, murder was involved in some fashion. So they created this this plan of a kidnapping. A kidnapping and one of the grand elements of their plan, Ian, you and I have talked about this before, the idea that one would hold one end of the rope and the other would hold the other end of the rope and they would simultaneously strangle so that they could not testify against one another and that we could, we could not surmise who was guilty for the actual act of killing. Which is legally garbage garbage because the answer to that is both and yes. like and the thing is is like people sometimes have this notion of like oh well if we're both involved then nobody can rat out the other one nobody can get offered a deal and the problem is is that it means that yes you can because they can just go to one of them and be like so if you testify that both of of you were involved We'll give, you know, we'll give you the better deal. We'll take the death penalty off the table for you. And we'll get it for your, uh, you know, your, your co-accused here. Or they'll say, you'll get life with the possibility of parole in 20. And he'll get life without the possibility of parole. So, you know, and you're thinking, well, I'm 20 now. So maybe I could get parole in my 40s. Now, I mean, you're not going to really build much of a life in your 40s if you're like you're applying for a job and it's like, okay, what's your resume? In prison for murder past 20 years. Before that, worked at McDonald's. <laughs> like, you know. Well, and and their their level of planning is specifically in this particular element shows exactly what Clarence Dara was talking about during that speech. That there's, you might have the intellect, you might have the intelligence, but there's an absence of actual on the ground wisdom and knowledge that would have told any person with half a brain, hey, if I have one end of the rope and they have the other end of the rope and we strangle someone together, we're both guilty. And the thing is, as well, is the people who are actually capable of committing a perfect murder also probably go there is no scenario where this actually makes uh makes sense like there there the cost benefit on this is stupid the the likelihood of getting away with it even with what you think is perfection is you know maybe you can get it to 70% cool 70% is you know, th those are great Vegas numbers, but they're awful numbers for, you know, for this particular kind of gambling where it's like you're going to go to jail for the rest of your life. Um, well, and that that begins the yeah. pre-planning here. So here's what the plan was. The plan they surmised was the typewriter comes back, by the way. So the typewriter is now involved in the plan. The plan was they were going to kidnap the child of some wealthy parents. Okay. They never intended to release that child. They were going to kidnap the child of wealthy parents. They were going to use uh, some agent to um, incapacitate that child. Then they were going to dispense was it with ether the child. they were planning on using. I think it was ether. Yeah. And I mean, there's the one of the things is that uh, in this era, there was a ton of kidnappings, right? Um, and the problem with that with kidnapping is that there's a real weak point to the whole plan because you'd kidnap the kid of some rich family and you'd be like, we need, you know, 
and you're picking like, you know, time appropriate amounts of money. So we need $20,000, which nowadays would not be nearly enough, but you know, that's your, your thing. And then at some point you have to actually get the money. And that's the weak point because that's when they tackle you. Right. So, um, you're sitting there and it's like, okay, at some point you're going to get, and people would come up with all sorts of clever schemes for this. They'd come up with things like, um, you know, get on this train with a bag of money. When you see us, you know, signal you, then you throw the money. Um, I love that you said that because you know exactly what they did in this, in this particular case. Yep. <laughs> So, and, and but the they're not the is, only ones. I mean, people would have all sorts of notions about how this would go. And always, like, the point of failure on these kidnappings was almost always the handoff. The, right? Or the kidnapping itself. Like, the kidnapping gets messy. Oh, there was a case, and this is back in the same era, where somebody decided to kidnap this, this youngster who was like a 17 year old, they were going to kidnap the 17 year old heir apparent to this uh, family's wealth. Well, um, when you're a 17 year old, who's got more money than God, because you're a member of this family, you pick up hobbies and the hobby, this particular kid oh, had no. picked up was boxing. <laughs> <laughs> and so they got their butts kicked by this 17 year old who was a boxer. And so it, rather than being this big story in this sense, it was kind of a much more minor footnote, but yeah, the kid just beat the crap out of them because they decided to kidnap this, like this guy who can literally spend 10 hours a day boxing because he's got the money to do nothing else. So <laughs> that's a fair Thank comment. You, <laughs> Thank you, Celine. No, she's keeping track. She does this to me when I was doing the Maya coverage too. It's phenomenal. I love it. Um, but you're right. So with Leopold and Loeb, one of the interesting things that I found about their planning was how much time they placed in the, the planning of retrieving the money, right? They placed a significant amount of time in the timing of the train. So they pre-planned to the point where they had one of them dry, riding on the train. The other one gave the time and they threw a box out of the train, a moving train, and the other one retrieved it. And they were so delighted that it landed exactly where they predicted it would land when given the designated time. So go on the train, wait five minutes, toss it out the window, right? That element they focused so intently on, but they just kind of flew past this idea that we were just going to drug the kid and that was going to be the end of it. We were going to drug them, get them in the car, and we weren't going to have to deal with any of the other stuff until we got to dispensing of the body. So they go and pre-plan every element of that, but the actual parts of a crime had the person had wisdom of age and, and experience was not very appropriately planned. Another case in point, the car. Their plan was that they would rent a car and they would leave their vehicle back at the house. Well, just the act of renting a car when you have to make an exchange of the car creates a problem and does create a problem in this case. So the pre-plan itself demonstrates that while they were of high intellect, they lacked a lot of real world experience. And if you, I think that the, there are people who have the brain to get to, to this and what they come to is just, you know what? It sounded like a good idea on paper. There's just too many problems. Um, scratch it. Like the best. And that was, did you read the description of the video? So I, I, I haven't. Okay. Little sidetrack. I learned that the best laid plans of mice and men was not actually the quote. The quote actually came from a 1785 poem by Robert Burns, a Scottish poet who wrote an entire poem about this mouse uh, that was living in the fields that he was plowing in the moment. And that when the plow ran through the mouse's home, it destroyed the home. The mouse had laid his nest. He had gone and gathered all of the things 
And all of that planning, all of that gathering for the coming winter was destroyed in an instant. And the line that we always say, the best laid plans of mice and men is actually read the best laid screams of mice and men. Gang after agly, I, and lay us not but grief and pain. Uh, leave us not but grief and pain. So the best laid schemes of mice and men, leave us not but grief and pain for promised joy. And it was very, it was, it was interesting to me to read the poem because it was this idea that while you might have this notion of every conceivable outcome, the world around you is far bigger than you yourself. And the world might have other plans. So your plans, while they are great in your world, in the world of this 19 and 18 year old young man, while they're great plans and they're remarkably maybe in, in intellectually uh, stimulating or intelligent, the world is far bigger than what you can see in that moment. So I thought it was really interesting. Um, that was the pre-planning. Now let's go to the actual day of the crime. So here were the and, steps of the pre-plan. And the number of criminals who have, um, uh, who've been busted on really stupid details would tell you that if you're trying to think of like some perfect plan, um, you know, you get guys who are like really clever serial killers who get busted because a red light camera went off and captured their plate near the scene. You know, and it's like, you can't predict everything. Um, nope. Some Instagram, you know, celebrity takes a selfie near you and catches you in the background. You know, and you're done. Like, that's it. Um, so, yeah. So with that in mind, look at the steps of this particular plan. This was the step. A most clever and careful plan to commit the, quote, perfect crime. One, find child of wealthy parents check two rent quote untraceable vehicle uh problem three kidnap <laughs> type child and drug slash is... incapacitate kidnap victim but not kill yet problem there is no such thing as an untraceable vehicle untraceable anything four stop for hot dogs and root beer they did do that five demand ransom not too much not too little six designate place to throw for moving train seven test ransom throw and recovery distance of travel, timing, etc. Eight, eliminate kidnap victim, mutually assured destruction with the simultaneous strangulation. Nine, dispose of remains in a drain pipe. How could that possibly go wrong? And 10, collect ransom and ride off into the sunset until your next criminal urge. And the thing is, is they had so much money. Like this, uh, this wasn't about actually getting the money for these kids. It was about keeping score. Yeah. But like, even looking at this, even looking at this plan, this demonstrates an absence of maturity in real world. Just circumstances. Every single element of this plan is fatally flawed. And I chose the word fatally flawed improperly. I, I apologize for that. That was, it was kind of an uh, oversight. So, the plan as it was carried out. Here's how the perfect crime actually met with real world challenges. One, rent Green Willie's Night. However, they swapped Leopold's car for the clean vehicle at Leopold's house in view of the valet who saw all of that and the swap of the vehicle. Two, Loeb goes and buys the chemicals from the drugstore and gets questioned by the drugstore, the drugstore shopkeeper who finds it odd the actual drugs being requested. So that's someone who remembers your, what took place. Three, Leopold then goes and contemporaneously purchases rope and a chisel that was not part of the plan. So, and this is the problem when you're, um, you know, if you have uh, another person in the plan, um, then yeah, 
Yep. Four, drugging an individual is more complicated than novels might suggest. When you put a rag over someone's face, they don't always cooperate. Usually Five, don't. <laughs> we must not forget the hot dogs and root beer. They don't. Six, body disposal isn't like it is in the novels. Things tend to both expand after death and float. Seven, where'd I put my damn glasses? Spoiler, <laughs> they weren't on his head. Eight, hey Google, how do you remove blood from upholstery? P.S. I hope no one's watching. Nine, a stolen typewriter leaves an impression, a unique impression. I like that I was funny with the words on that one. Uh, <laughs> ten, I think this was someone, very clever. Ten, someone always stitches. Even more so when you're self snitching to the media. Did we lay that? We laid that. We laid the God vices. You're terrible. My dates never seem to like that. You're terrible. Oh. I know you're joking, but terrible joke. Um, he's joking, folks. He doesn't actually wait. date. Wait, M. Young, did Google just answer you? <laughs> <laughs> did anyone else's google machine tell them how to get blood out of the oh. street <laughs> so now there's a whole bunch of people whose google has like pinned them as a, a murderer oh, no. i'm sorry should i repeat it to those who have the amazon equivalent no probably not no um okay. all right so the beginning of the plan here's the vehicle this is the actual vehicle I thought it was pretty interesting. So there's, this is now entering the era where we're starting to get a lot of the photographs and videos from the actual crime and time itself. So uh, news media is now heavily involved in these crimes because they realize it gets not clicks and views, but newspaper purchases. Pur purchases. So this is the lovely vehicle that was rented. Here is the route that was taken. I can't zoom in on this. Um, Hmm. Hmm. No, I can't zoom in. Hang on. Let me see if I can do this. Hmm. No. You went bye bye. No. No. <laughs> no. So, anyways, the route that was taken, they they remained local in their kidnapping. Generally speaking, a problem. Don't, Ian. Do not say that out loud. <laughs> do not say that out loud. <laughs> For those of you watching, please look at the screen. Do not say that out loud. <laughs> the screen said that. Ian is not saying that out loud because no. Um, so one of the first problems they made is they stayed local with their kidnapping. Big problem. I mean, that was one of the problems. One of the several problems. Yeah, First and mistake. also don't uh, don't look up luxury prisons in Utah. Yeah, don't do that. Luxury no, prisons don't. for the rich. Oh, God. The first mistake, renting a car always leaves a trail. Yeah. Yeah. You know, actual paperwork you have to sign to rent the car. Even I if mean, you use when a people false are, ID. Yeah, when people are lending you a car, they actually pay attention to who they're giving the car to because they want the car back. Like, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, hired help isn't what it used to be, but they sure do remember a lot of details. The valet in this particular case. The oh, valet. They, they thought oh. the valet was basically furniture. Yeah. And that would he would never remember the vehicle being exchanged or that they actually asked the valet for cleaning solvents to get the blood out of the upholstery rather than asking the valet to do it himself they asked him for the cleaning solution and that's what the next comment was damn bloody upholstery can be so stubborn so i should probably ask that very observant knowledgeable valet and the thing is is if they'd been smart they probably would have done something like gone and hunted a deer thrown that in the back seat pull up in the car and just hand it to the valet and been like can you deal with this and the valet would have just been like, yeah, those ass kids have given yep. me another nightmare to clean up and wouldn't have thought about it. Like he would have just been like those those dirtbag kids. 
I hate those those little world. rich, you know, dirt bags so much. But you know, let me go. Let me go <laughs> scrub it. Neek lost. You're terrible. Uh, <laughs> parentheses taking careful notes while ignoring thumping sounds from seller. And parentheses. Uh huh. So you've already screwed up the perfect crime because now there's a super chat. You messed it up. Now you, you left a record. <laughs> Second mistake. One, don't plan murder. <laughs> people are saying, Just, uh, don't teach people how to crime better. This will work great if you also have a time machine. Um, but if you don't, then they can DNA test and determine whether it was a deer or a person. But if you do have a time machine to go back to 1924, you could commit all sorts of perfect murders back then. Well, the, the funny thing was, when I was writing this first slide, because Lady Draconis gave me two slides. One first mistake, two second mistake. I was writing the first slide, and the first mistake, I was like, renting a car leaves a trail. Because that, in my mind, popped out as the first mistake. And then the second mistake was like, I was going, oh, shit. No, I should probably backtrack a second and say, no, don't plan murder. Don't plan murder. That's the mistake. Uh, also, hiding bodies at night tends to have consequences, you know, resulting from, you know, darkness, like not seeing. Uh, yeah, it, as it turns out, it's going to be a lot easier to see the body in the daylight. So that perfect hiding spot that you figured out in at night is going to be real obvious in the day. And this happens to all sorts of killers, by the way. There's or so if you're, many situations. If you're stumbling, stumbling through the woods at night, you run into a tree and tear your shirt or leave blood behind, or perhaps an object falls out of your pocket or off of your head that's easily identifiable. And the other problem that people have when they're like, oh, we're going to hide a body, is they forget that. Animals are really, really good at finding dead things because that's lunch to all sorts of, you know, scavenger creatures. Mm -hmm. And you know how many times it's been like, oh, let's go find a body. And they hire somebody who's a skilled tracker and they're just like, all right, you see all those ravens over there? That's our starting point. Because, like, I've literally seen in Disclosure... Um, where I was brought on because there was a gun issue, but you know, it wasn't my murder file, but it was quite literally, they like hired a guy who knew the area because he was a hunter and he found the body in 15 minutes. Yeah. Cause he because knew it was the, the things that were scavenging weren't usually there. He's like, there is like, it's not hunting season. That's a body like that. That Raven activity is a body. And so he just like 15 minutes, he's like, all right, found it. And that was even though they'd covered it with a bunch of stuff because the Ravens are sitting there trying to dig the stuff out of the way to um, to find it. Because, yeah, so animals are really good searchers. Niklas, you're killing me tonight, my friend. Rob says murder. No, Rob does not <laughs> say murder should be a spontaneous. No. Just I mean... Just just don't do it. You got to have a little spontane then, spontaneity then, or you take all the romance then, out of it. And then don't plan it. Uh, <laughs> three, maybe, just maybe, don't bring your super unique reading glasses to a crime scene. Hypothetically speaking, <laughs> don't do that. Four, bodies float and expand and don't cooperate with drain pipes. You know the really fun thing about expanding bodies? God, so I'm terrified where you're going with this. People spend a whole bunch of money on um, on coffins that are perfectly sealed, airtight. Don't do that. Because when oh. you decompose and you still decompose in there, oh, um, the you produce oh. a whole bunch of gases, you expand. Yep. And eventually the pressure is enough that it will force that coffin open. Even with the weight of all the dirt, it'll force it open. And then you, your body, exits the coffin under pressure in the same way that like Kraft Easy Cheese exits the can. Why? 
<laughs> just so that you Kraft, never eat Kraft easy, easy cheese. cheese. <laughs> just so you never eat that again. Uh, but the other thing that happens sometimes is police have to do a reinvestigation. And so they go and investigate the cop. Like they have to dig up the body. And the worst thing is if it's been sealed in an airtight oh, no. casket. No, no, no. Because then they crack it open, and the instant nope. they do, everything mm -mm. inside that exits outside under pressure. Nope. There were there, there was you know there was a little bit of science in that. There was so much so little science in that mo in that slide. Like I put a tiny bit in there, <laughs> and and I, I I didn't see the craft cheese thing coming out of this, but they used to make I, a product I, that I was like cheese in a pressurized can. Should have known. I really should have known. Oh, oh, <laughs> yeah. And then also the other thing is when you put an expanding thing in a drain pipe and water pressure builds up behind that thing, water pressure, water under pressure in a confined space in a pipe is going to uh, just do its thing and shove that thing out of the pipe. Um, maybe so. Point five. Maybe. Opt if, writing left handed. Go ahead. If I'm ever called upon to write like a Hollywood script, one of the ideas in my head is you know, it's no. like the perfect murder, no, which is a comedy, a very, very dark comedy, but a comedy. I, I would watch it, <laughs> I would completely watch it with an exploding <laughs> coffin, and yeah, but no, but again. <laughs> I'll watch it. And if you want, if you want to help editing the script, I'm happy to do that too. So yeah. Ch Chesney for Ian. I love how your brain works. I do too. <laughs> it's scary sometimes. Um, point five, maybe opt for writing left-handed rather than using a typewriter that leaves very distinct letter impressions. Number six, repeat. Don't, Plan murder repeated because dumb. Uh, seven, remember someone always snitches. Eight, again, don't plan murder, saying it louder for the folks in the back. Niklas, no, don't, don't, don't. It doesn't, not spontaneous. No, no murders. <laughs> the victim in the car. So both Leopold and Loeb knew Bobby Franks. Um, as we discussed, Bobby Franks was the cousin of, and I'm, I always screw up Leopold and Loeb. The thing is, they both had L as the last name, and it always confused the heck out of me. Uh, Bobby Franks was the cousin of Loeb, Richard. So they lured Bobby Franks with discussion of a, of a tennis racket. So he's walking home from tennis and they said, hey, that's a lovely racket. Why don't you come over to the car? Drove around town with him. I feel vehicle. like this is a tactic that wouldn't work now. No, probably not. Hey, it's a cool You go up to some racket. random you kid and you're like, vehicle? yeah, hey, this is a lovely racket. Come over to this vehicle. That kid is like immediately call, dialing 911. Yeah, they drive around town with him in the car. And then... They try to drug him, but the drugging does not work because individuals with a rag placed over their face don't tend to cooperate. So we don't know exactly who was in the back seat or front seat because they both snitched on each other. One of them reaches from behind because Bobby Franks is in the front passenger seat. One of them reaches from behind and tries to drug him and drag him back. That fails because. Cloth over mouth, violent reaction. So what they end up doing, instead of holding that over his mouth and trying to get the, let the drugs take effect, is they stuff the rag down his throat. And I'm just going to note, He's like, when you watch in a movie, the movie is always like, you know, they have the rag and it's just like, rag, and then the person passes out, right? Uh, what it's actually more like in real life is rag minutes of fighting and like a lengthy time and you know like two three minutes and then they pass out and again and their so, plan was to be driving around actively while this was happening 
No. Yeah, it was it was a terrible plan. So that doesn't work. So they end up shoving the rag down his throat and, and enter the chisel. And they bash him over the head with that and stab him. And it wasn't clear that he died from that. Actually, it was spec. It was it was opined that he had actually suffocated from the rag being down his throat. Um, but that's what eventually kills him. All of that violence and craziness was not really enough for them because why not? They then stop at the Dew Drop Inn, which is actually depicted here. This is an actual image of this place. The Dew Drop Inn, a sandwich shop for Red Hots, which are hot dogs, and root beers. They were stopping to make sure that the, the, the light of the day would, would pass and they would end up driving at night. So, you know, you just have a drugging go terribly wrong. You have to bring out a chisel and what you think is to kill the person, but doesn't really kill the person. And they suffocate and you're like, I would like a hot dog right now. So why not? And they drive around until it gets dark. They park and they drag the body to a drain pipe, a pipe drain. And this is the actual pipe drain that they actually drag the body to. And now I'm just thinking like, they, why do you plan for hot dogs? I, I don't know. The, this plan that is part weird. Always. That part has really always bothered me. Like it, I mentioned in several slides. I'm midway through a murder. Let's have a hot dog. Yeah, I don't know. Car Caroline has the best remark. Maybe they didn't like hamburgers. <laughs> it's probably the only thing they can. They, that's probably only, I. I can't think of anything else. So, but they do that, and and all in the all in this time, they're kind of excited about what they've just done, and they're looking forward to this typing. They had pre-typed a note or parts of it. So. No, it wasn't created. It was not to create an alibi. No, there was no alibi by this. The alibi was the rented car. There was no alibi with the hot dog stand. It was honestly to buy time. They needed to buy time for it to get dark. So they take the body to the drain pipe and they stuff the body into the drain pipe. They have remarkable difficulty getting the human body, which is a lot more difficult to manage after it is deceased into this drain pipe. And on the way back, um, it was, uh, was it, no, it was Leah. I think it was Nathan. Nathan had the glasses. Glasses. Hang on. Where are my notes? Well, you guys can screw up Nathan and I was going to screw this up the entire time. I'm going to mix them up the whole damn time. Yeah. Nathan Leopold. They were his glasses. And these are the actual glasses depicted on, on screen right now. So these are the actual glasses themselves. When they are, after they have stuffed the body in the culvert, in the drain, they are retrieving their items and they are going back to the vehicle. They get back to the vehicle and Nathan distinctly remembers hearing something in the woods. So like something dropped, but they don't go back and check. Lo and behold, it was this set of glasses, the set of glasses that just so happened to be remarkably unique in character. Those kind of look like the U.S. military's uh, BC glasses. I mean, they were prescription. So they're one, they were prescription if, glasses. So if you know what I'm talking about, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to. But yeah, I mean, this is a time when glasses were highly unique. But even now, I mean, um, like my glasses, you could get a fair bit of deep like information from, um, you know, they got a serial number on them, but also just the prescription of the glasses would be highly, um, highly probative. <laughs> what was unique about these glasses wasn't really the frame. It wasn't the lenses. It was the hinge. So the hinge to these glasses between, you know, the ear and the, the actual 
the glasses themselves. The hinge was a very specific manufacturer. Uh, and it was manufactured by a, a New York company that had only one outlet. <laughs> Almer, Almer Co. and Co. Only one outlet uh, and in the entirety of Chicago. In criminal investigations, one is the worst number. Because well, if they can well, narrow something down to one, that's that's bad. Um, so the funny thing is, it wasn't one, but it might as well have been because that particular company had sold three of those glasses with those hinges. Three total. Uh -huh. So you have three. One of them was to a lady. Not you could not, probably rule her out just probably. by virtue of it's not that likely. That's a big body to carry through those woods. Um, yeah, two, people don't gen like playing the odds, it's almost certainly not. So the second set belonged to an attorney who was traveling in Europe at the time. Um, Which is... Enough, this has an overlap with another trial of century. So the attorney, Jerome Frank, 30 years from this date, about, ends up being the appellate judge who denies the uh, the plea of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg for a stay of their executions. <laughs> and I'm just going to say, um, in another country is a great alibi. Yeah. I was, where, where were you, sir? Uh, not here. Where? Another Spain. country. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're okay. Good. Got it. And the third set of glasses, well, they belong to Nathan Leopold. So, like, this is worse than the OJ gloves. So now we're down to what? Mm-hmm. We're down and to what? one is that terrible number that you just never want, never want to be at if you one are committing crimes. Number that there ever was. One is the loneliest number. Okay. Uh, this is the actual typewritten note. Actually, let me see if I can't find a way to blow this image up. I think I have a zoom in of it. Yeah, there we go. So this is the actual typewritten note that was used for ransom. Zoomed in. Here's a typewriter that was actually recovered when they tossed it in the river. Dear sir, proceed immediately. Do you see how there's a fade on the tail end of that T? Like where yep. it, it leaves a very distinct impression. Proceed immediately to the back platform of the train. Watch the east side of the track. Have your package ready. Look for the first large red brick factory situated immediately adjoining the tracks on the east. On top of this factory is a large black water tower with the word champion written on it. Wait until you have completely passed the south end of the factory. Count five very rapidly and then immediately throw the package as far east as you can. Remember that this is your only chance to recover your son, yours truly. Are you kidding me? How many things are wrong with this note? Like a lot. All of them. What's your first? Which one's your first? What's your first gripe with the note? I mean, you, if you look at this note, you've got to be looking at this going, hey, um, these letters are real distinctive. But after that, it's like the first large red brick factory. So there's more than one large red brick factory. Now we're getting into problems of like, what if the guy goes to the wrong red brick factory? Um, what if they're like me and they just kind of zone out on this train trip and like snap back to and are like, did I miss it? <laughs> uh, <sighs> Count five very rapidly. What's very rapidly? One, two, three, four, five, yeet. One, two, three, four, five, yeet. I don't know. Um, how fast is the train going? You don't know for sure. And if I've got this letter, I am telling the cops to go find the champion factory, like this particular location, and be hiding out there. I love that your brain went in a very different place than mine did, because this is where mine went. Too well written. Remember that thing that Clarence Darrow was saying about people that commit crime and how they tend to be in a certain class of the population? Oh, that absolutely. Might be particularly true, but this this ransom note 
is remarkably well written. The punctuation it is the phrasing, the language, dear sir, yours truly. Everything about this is you, you can eliminate a ton of people just by the language that's used. I mean, if you wanted to make this look like it was coming from an actual criminal, you got to like take it down about 10 grade levels. Um, you got to put some spelling mistakes in there. You got to put some. Um, yeah. And that's an indented paragraph. Someone says indented paragraphs. It's a very formal ransom note. That's why I said it would have been better if they tried to write it left-handed than trying to type it all out perfectly. Like this immediately, and then and then that is all of that is to say, without even identifying the fact that that T on this particular typewriter leaves a very faint tail end of the T, very distinctive. Yep. You know, we can talk a lot about matches, right? You know, you know, I've you and I have opined. Um, also, not all the... typewriters would be capable of doing the underline that you see there. Yeah, that's true. You can you can you can bring some of them out. Now, a lot of them, a lot of you and I have been very skeptical of this matching stuff, where uh, people say I got an identical match on a hair follicle, right? And we're like, hey, no, you got a similarity. But when and you the have thing a is, world... is, I wouldn't say an identical match, but I'd say. You can find similarity and a typewriter isn't like a cell phone or a computer. Now, when you're talking yes, about 1924, exactly. This is far more like, I don't know, um, an industrial lathe where you're talking about something that is like a $25,000 piece of equipment or thereabouts. Like it probably wasn't that expensive, but it's an unusual piece of equipment, right? It's an unusual and rare piece of equipment. Um, so you're already getting into like specialist stuff. Um, and you're in 1924. Yeah. The world of typewriters is a lot smaller than it was several years later. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, same way if you had something that was computer printed. If you have that now. Um, Impossible. Computer printed is um computer printed is like okay whatever everything's computer printed uh but if you take that back to like the old dot 1972 printers. or something um you're looking at a very different world um even like 1985 like when i was a kid the number of households that had access to um like to a printer was was smaller mm -hmm. so yeah even the typewritten phrase like the brick factory situated and and the fact that they use the hyphen <laughs> to to like go to the next next line so this is actually a photograph of the search point that i made earlier in the slide where did you go wrong you kidnapped the son of a wealthy individual who is immediately going to go to the press and immediately going to bring to bear all of their resources mm -hmm. for a search. And that search is going to begin forthwith with a lot of people invested in finding the body of this person. So they begin the search. Remember that self snitching thing? Mm hmm. I'm not going to say pro tip. Pro tip. <laughs> if you happen to perpetuate the crime, I know that you're fascinated with yourself and in, in, in trying to get away with it. But maybe don't start offering opinions on the victim of the crime that they might have, you know, couldn't think of someone else who was more deserving or or don't start offering opinions on where to locate the body and start talking to journalists as this photo of Richard Loeb depicts him speaking to journalists around the scene where the body was recovered. And I'm just going to note, there are basically two outcomes of you giving an opinion as to where the body is located to journalists. 
outcome number one, you give them the correct opinion. At which point you have basically like pointed a searchlight directly at yourself. Outcome number two, you give them an incorrect opinion, in which case this will be still used against you at trial to say he attempted to mislead the search and send, and he had so little remorse that even knowing these parents were agonizing over the death of their child, he attempted to make sure that this would not be found because he is a villain and a, you know, so. Yep. Yeah. LK Ryden, how to know a murderer will get caught. They believe they'll get away with it. People who think they can get caught. People who get away with it for years are surprised when they get caught faster. Exhibit A. Yeah. I know there's one guy who actually went and tried to turn himself in for a murder. And the one of the things that's interesting is that people fairly often try to turn themselves in for crimes they didn't actually commit. And the police thought he was one of those. And it was only later when they started doing some of the math on that. And they were like, oh, that guy is actually on our suspect list. Um, that they went, huh, maybe we should actually talk to the guy. And, and he was like, how did it take you so long? I confessed. And they're like, yeah. Mm hmm awkward <laughs> well and then there's nathan leopold pointing out to the journalists everything there there we go that's the culvert and there's nathan leopold now they find the victim here's the chicago daily tribune after the murder kidnap rich boy kill him news summary robert franks is the victim of a mysterious death question three of his instructors the letter with the death threat sent to the father. I mean, this is back when multiple multiple articles would end up on the same uh, cover of a, a newspaper. So the police get wind that this is all going to uh, occur, um, or the police get wind that this might be there. They might they have the glasses, right? So they bring in or they ask to interview the boys. We want to very nicely, you know, we are the police. We would like to interview uh, your children, Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb, who at least one of them was age of majority. The other one was not, I believe. And the parents are like, sure. Why would parents go um, ahead and talk to the police? Parents, um, if you were ever in this situation, no matter what the offense is, and no matter how much you think your kid is a little crap who ought to take responsibility, do not have them do a police interview. The number of parents I've seen who's, who have just been like, you need to take responsibility for this, and you're just going to tell the police everything that, you know, that happened, and it'll be fine. And then later, I have to try to un-F things. And to explain to the parents, like, just how much they screwed their kid up. Well, it's um, worse. The parents, in this case, were so disconnected because they weren't involved in their kids' lives that the parents were like, they couldn't have possibly done this. You go explain it to them and make it go away. Yeah, no. And the old line is, you know, if you have committed the crime, get a lawyer, don't talk to the cops. And if you are innocent of the crime... Get a lawyer, don't talk to the cops. Exactly. That's the, th <laughs> so, um, I had a guy and I ended up like basically just offering to represent this guy for basically beer money. Uh, because I see this guy and he's like, I just want to set a trial date for my drug trafficking charges. And the court is like, are you sure you don't want a lawyer? He's like, no, it's not going to be a big deal. I'm innocent. And I'm like, well, that's the one you, you, you said you said the thing you said a word out loud and the thing is i believe he was innocent like i believe like looking over his file i gen genuinely believe the guy was innocent um but he needed he needed somebody to be there to argue for it because he was still found near drugs 
And so you need like the guy needed a criminal defense lawyer to be like, hey, listen, just because he was near the drugs, here's, you know, here's the issues. And I, you know, and ultimately the guy like he was cut loose. He didn't end up going to trial. Um, but that happened because he had a lawyer there helping him out. And I mean, the guy easily, if he decided he wanted to run that himself. I mean, he could have been looking at like, you know, more than five years. Five years would have been the uh, the bottom floor on on that. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, and I think I made like a hundred bucks on that file, but I kept now, an innocent guy out of jail. So, what's interesting here is that the one thing that these two did that was remarkably bright was they they rehearsed their their whereabouts. They rehearsed everything about what they would say. They knew each other's story backwards and forwards. They were out on a date. Uh, they were on double dates in, um, uh, I think it was Richard's vehicle. They were out on double dates. Great, we're going to need to talk to the women. Well, and and they didn't remember who the ladies were. It, it was it was the lies aligned perfectly to the point where the police were like, they're pretty damn good. But the police knew that the glasses were an issue. So the police release them because one of the things that cops do is sometimes they'll release you and put you in this false sense of security and bravado that you might have gotten away with something because they know you're going to do something stupid. Also, pro tip, if you have if the police seem to think you were involved in a murder and you got released, do not go to the like to the body because the chances you're being surveilled are about one in one. Um, that's a that's a hundred percent chance, folks. I'm bad at math, but I know that one in one is a hundred percent. But wait, there's more. Oops, something is missing. The realization that glasses are missing. The glasses were found near the victim. They trace it to the Chicago optometrist. The optometrist reports only making three pairs, one to Nathan Leopold. We talked about the other two. When Nathan Leopold was questioned about the glasses, he said, well, I don't know where they are. I can't produce them, but I know that they're there. Now, they did a search. They did a search warrant of the house, and they turn up the glasses case, but not the glasses. He says he lost them out of his pocket, oh but he couldn't God. demonstrate how they fell out. And I mean, the thing is, is if he if he'd been smart and been like, I lost those, you know, some time ago. Now, the problem is that somebody then shows up to say, well, he said that, but I saw him wearing these glasses last week. Um, don't bring uh -huh. your unique stuff to crimes. Ideally, don't bring your unique you to crimes. Yeah, don't because do you know, there's only one you, uh, but everything else that is unique, don't bring it to crimes. So then the cops find the case, and now Nathan Leopold has a problem. Second interview, I mean, he had a problem beforehand, but now he's got a second problem. S second interview, and the photograph on the right shows you how that interview went. Second interview was textbook by the cops and Robert Crow was involved who's a prosecutor that charged the case eventually but they divide and conquer so they separate Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb into different rooms because when they're in different rooms now you can start to suggest that one might turn on the other and now you have one little piece of evidence that's distinct have you seen the wire no I have not Oh, you have got to see the wire. No, I've been told that I have to see it. I've been told. There's a scene in the wire that's brilliant. And so um, they have two guys who they think are involved in a crime. And they put them each in separate interview rooms because you're always going to be interviewed separately in that. And the one guy's like, hey, man, can I get some like, you know, I'm a little hungry. Can I get some food? And they're like, yeah, you're not getting, you know, a damn thing until you start talking. And the guy's like, well, screw you, cops. 
And then they go and they get a whole big thing of McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And his, his like co-accused isn't talking either. But they make sure to bring that McDonald's bag right and in walk front of it the door. Past, walk it past him so that he can yep. see it going to the another um to the other cell. And then he's like, Well, my the other guy's clearly talking. I better start mm -hmm. talking myself. And so he starts spilling things. And this is a tactic that is straight out of Sun Tzu. Literally, the art of war describes this divide, tactic. Yeah, divide and conquer. And, you know, it's it's an ancient tactic, but it's used all sorts of, um, you know, in all sorts of places. So, um, yeah, the the number of times they're like, hey, um, yeah. Now, the chauffeur. So two big facts, two of the biggest facts. One, the glasses. So now you've got leverage and the, the stories start to fall apart. And two, the chauffeur. So the chauffeur had originally said that, yes, the boys weren't at the house. They were out driving in the vehicle. Chauffeur didn't speak great English. Didn't really understand the question. When the question was then rephrased, when the chauffeur understood what was being asked, the chauffeur then explained, no, they were not in the vehicle that was owned by Richard Loeb. They were in a different vehicle. They changed vehicles. And by the way, there's more to the story. There was, how do I clean this wine, quote, wine out of the upholstery, which seemed odd to the chauffeur because the chauffeur had been asked to clean everything else forever until the end of time. Yeah, I mean, so, the help gets asked to clean things, and they're used to it. But, yeah. So, lo and behold, Loeb and Leopold, lo and behold, Loeb and Leopold, um, one of them Loeb says and the other behold. one did it. Yeah, I know. One of them says the other one did it. The other one says the other one did it. They point the finger back at each other. And now it's, well, they got them. So, we're going to go ahead and charge this. And the parents are, of course, shocked. But enter the party litigants, the attorneys. Clarence Darrow. Clarence Darrow had, in the past few years, tried a number of cases, including the Scopes Monkey Trial, Sacco and Vanzetti, had remarkable trial experience, but was in poor health at this point in time. He was kind of on a sabbatical, if we would talk about that. Then, But Leopold's father wouldn't accept anything but the best and offers to give... Mr. Darrow, $70,000 for a murder trial, for this murder trial. And the evidence in this murder trial is a uh, conviction, like it, just conviction. The evidence, all of the evidence is conviction. There is no hope. There is no defense. There is just, you did the thing and they're going to prove it. That $70,000 in attorney's fees gets inflated up to today at $1.2 million, which those of you in the chat that are sitting there thinking that's a lot for a murder charge, not here, not with these facts, not in these circumstances, that's cheap. Oh my God, that's cheap. Yeah. The amount of resources that had to be brought to bear in this particular trial were exponential, which I'll go into in a moment. The prosecutor, state attorney, Robert Crow. Robert Crow was the state attorney for Cook County. He was the chief investigator of this case and the chief prosecutor. Would you say he had some familiar, familiarity with the facts? He was previously a circuit I court mean, he knows, judge. He knows something about glasses. I mean, <laughs> what, what? look at the contrast between these two gentlemen. Darrow who just looks gruff crow. I mean, just yeah. He was a judge before he became the prosecutor. So he's been on the bench. He knows how this thing works. And he had the nickname of dynamite crow because he would explode in anger and frustration. He was, he was a theatrical individual crow's strategy in this particular case 
and I kind of just to you know paraphrase, they will surely plead insanity. He then goes out and hires the four best forensic psychiatrists in the area and gives money to everyone else to guarantee that there are no experts available for Clarence Darrow. Just, just brilliant move. Brilliant move. Go it out and hire isn't. all the experts. It isn't now because it's the courts not. have clued in on this particular move. Yeah. And um, their response to that move now is to, um, um, if you do it, they will say, okay, well, we'll find an expert from somewhere else and the other side will pay for it. What is it? Where is it? Where is it? Hettinger. Not psychiatrist, alienists. I'm not letting you get away with that term. Nope. It's and you know, that's a fair point. They were alienists. Um, that's what was referred, that's what they referred to as in the day. That's what they are. Crow's strategy was to hire the psychiatrists away from the defense so that they didn't have experts working in their favor. And then he thought, well, what if they rely on the absence of evidence? He then files a witness list of 102 witnesses. Like this. Where was it? No, no, I had the picture of it. Where's the witness list? No, I had it. Anyways, files a list of 102 witnesses. We're going to call all these individuals to trial. Okay. Judge John Caverly, younger than Crow or Darrow, he was the chief judge of Cook County. He had a history in the juvenile court system, which is significant because of Darrow's appeal to him, Darrow's plea. This is a judge who had seen children, minors, in the juvenile court process. The question is, was he opposed to the death penalty or not? The experts. Oh, God, did they do investigations and evaluations, and they all had opinions, and the opinions were as far-reaching as the bridge of the nose would have told you that this one was the killer and this one was not. I mean, really, all of it. Also, Wait, how come this guy is the only guy with decent glasses? Which one? Caverly? Judge. I know, very classy, right? You're talking in I mean, compared are... to Crow? Yeah. Style of the day, man. I can't. I, I like the bow tie, though. Oh, the bow tie is great. Um, Solid bow tie. Yeah, I got nothing wrong with that. So... Here's the question. We have the experts come in and the experts are all opining on whether these two young men had the ability to form the requisite intent to commit the murder or whether they were legally insane and could not stand trial. That was what Robert Crow thought was going to be the argument. Crow was positioning his chessboard for a fight against the insanity defense. It's geared up for trial completely ready to go for it, and he was talking to the press. The media hated these kids. They wanted these kids to get the death penalty. They wanted to hang him. They wanted to hang him. They wanted electrocution. They wanted the kids to get the death penalty. And Crow was a driving factor to that, saying how these elite kids, they thought they would get away with everything. We need to set an example. We need to, to you know, find the capital punishment. We need to hang these two young men so they can never do anything like this again. And we can set an example for everyone else tending towards crime in the future, right? So the media becomes heavily invested in the trial. That's very relevant. Because then the judge starts receiving death threats. That if the judge does not grant capital punishment, that the judge might receive that punishment by the mob. Hmm. Generally speaking, not the way to win your argument. Nope. Enter the brilliance of Clarence Darrow. And I mean, if I am if I'm a judge and that's your argument, I'm like, you know it's not happening, right? Um like hey mob, bring it. Um, because we're not making that happen. Yeah, but it was so bad that they actually called his wife. They phoned his wife and said that her husband was shot and that she needed to come quickly. And the wife stormed out, 
only to discover that the husband was there giving like a speech or remarks. Like this is, it was pretty dark what they did. Um, but so everything is lined up and you have Robert Crow who was previously bested by Darrow in another significant trial. Crow, the, the prior year, I think had taken a loss against Darrow and was stinging. Oh, you got to love when it's uh, the rematch. Oh yeah. This is grudge match rematch. So Crow has lined up. He has hired every expert and said, ha ha, sorry, Darrow. And he filed a li list of 102 witnesses. You're not getting out of this. So Darrow watching this amp up to trial in the days prior to trial, Darrow flips the plea and says, Nope, they're going to plea guilty, which was freaking brilliant because when you're trying to surmise guilt, who makes the determination of guilt, Ian? Hmm. Well, that'd be the judge if it's, I mean. No, if, this is a jury trial. Oh, I mean, if it's a jury trial, then it's the jury makes the determination of guilt, but of it's guilt. the judge makes the determination of sentence. Yeah. Correct. But if, if the entire body politic, if the entire populace can hear an entire trial going over these two boys and what they did, would you think but the if, judge would be pigeonholed into a certain disposition? Uh-huh. Well, the other thing is, if the judge is accepting the guilty plea, then the judge is the one making the finding of guilt in that circumstance. Yes, so you're right. That is the, the end run the around the ones. jury making the finding. Yep. So the finder of fact would have been the jury. If it was a jury trial, then Mr. Crow would have been able to present his 102 witnesses and his four experts to say that these two boys could never, ever be rehabilitated, that they should be brought to the gallows, hanged, and executed immediately. And Darrow <laughs> says, nah, I know that you've put a lot of time and effort into preparing this trial, but we're going to go ahead and plead guilty, and I'm going to argue sentencing. That is such a beautifully dick move. <laughs> such a dick move. <laughs> He's been preparing a hundred and whatever witnesses, and he just oh. walks in. He's like, you can dismiss your witnesses, sir. I am pleading guilty. And, and to think that Darrow had gone against Crow in an earlier trial and brought him to the line and getting a jury verdict in his clients, you know, you're doing all of this and you're fighting that fight. And Darrow does the trial tactics and the everything about the objections and, and brings in the, the surprise witness, all of the above. So Crow is ready for everything. He's ready for everything except a guilty plea. <laughs> oh. So Darrow, knowing that his clients were going to be convicted and likely executed, decided and consulted with the clients. The clients decided, the two boys decided, they were going to flip their plea to guilty. And that Darrow would then have the opportunity to present evidence and argument on sentencing alone. Here's here here's the list. I knew I had a grand total of 102. Here's the list of witnesses, the witness list. So you go through this time, and again, this was typed up on a typewriter. Like you type all these names, you prep all the witnesses, you do all the work, all the heavy yeah. lifting. You're ready for trial. You file the witness list, your witnesses are lined up, they're all under subpoena, and Darrow says, nah, guilty. Let's argue sentencing. Yeah. Oh man. So the advantages and disadvantages of the jury versus the bench trial. I talked a little bit about this, but Ian, did you have any additional thoughts on like, if you're, if you're this defense attorney, why would you want a judge and not a jury? Well, I don't know if this is an area where the jury gets to make sentencing recommendations, but no. um, judge only you want, I mean, you can, one of the things that you get a bit of an advantage of is that when you're pleading guilty, you can shape the facts a little bit. Um, and the prosecution gets to really hammer on facts, whereas you're just getting to tender, like, here's what we admit. And that's it. Like, that's that's all. Um, it really 
changes the equation in a big way. Um, I think, no, I mean, this this is a brilliant move, but it's a dick move not to give them advance notice. I mean, Daryl was, was being... a lot of, what I'm saying is Daryl was a lot of things. Did you ever know him to be courteous to opposing counsel? No. And I mean, <laughs> Daryl specifically leaned into the notion of like being, um, that you have to be a bit wild. Right. Um, so yeah. Yep. So Darrow then decides to engage in a little tactic of uh, what I call is a uh, um, trial by filibuster, but not really. Darrow makes an eight and a half hour closing argument. Eight and a half hours of closing argument. Now, you heard his cadence, his voice, his speech, his mannerisms. I would sit there and watch for eight and a half hours, and I'd probably be enthralled the whole damn time. And this is just one passage from Darrow's plea of mercy. Plea to save these boys from the gallows. Quote, I can think and only think, Your Honor, of taking two boys, one 18 and the other 19, irresponsible, weak, diseased, penning them in a cell, checking off the days and hours and minutes until they're taken out and hanged. Wouldn't it be a glorious day for Chicago? Wouldn't it be a glorious triumph for the state's attorney? Wouldn't it be a glorious triumph for justice in this land? Wouldn't it be a glorious illustration of the Christianity and kindness and charity? I can picture them wakened in the gray light of morning, furnished in a, uh, furnished a suit of clothes by the state, led to the scaffold, their feet tied, black caps drawn over their heads, stood on a trap door, the hangman pressing a spring so that it gives way under them. I can see them fall through space and stopped by the ropes around their necks. Wow. If you want to illustrate to a judge exactly what decision that judge is making, mm -hmm. it's about as good as you can get. And the I, thing is, that sentencing is all about appeals to emotion. Um, and that's on both sides, right? Sentencing is all about appeals to emotion because there really isn't like a mathematical certainty to it. Right. It's not like, is this evidence admissible or not? You know, where you're relying on the case law. It's. Um, yeah. So, of course, they're going to make appeals to emotion. And Daryl was uh, was brilliant at it. Well, and so I just read that paragraph. But let's let's go back to I want to I pull this up because I think that we're missing the cadence of who Darrow was as a lawyer back to him speaking. Now imagine that paragraph I just read and the sarcasm and cynicism dripping from every word. And imagine this is the person delivering that to you, the judge on the bench. I don't know whether there's an increase of crime or not. That's a question that can't well be answered. We do know that there's an increase in the population of our prisons, and a very decided one. The policy of America seems to be to build bigger and better prisons, just the same as bigger and better factories. This increase in the population of prisons has come about by the intense, cruel, unfair hatred that has attended every effort to deal with the question of crime. It resulted in a great increase of laws and a lengthening of terms in prison. 
Crime doesn't depend entirely on what people do. It depends likewise on laws. For instance, one quarter of all the people in our federal prisons are there for selling liquor, which is not and should not be really a crime. Then, I mean, he's wrong about that. Hatred has been generated <laughs> against the enemy. <inmates. laughs> I've made judges give long terms. And juries find more men guilty. So that's the cadence, that's the voice, and we're going to read this one more time. I can think, and only think, Your Honor, of taking two boys, one 18 and the other 19, irresponsible, weak, diseased, hanging them in a cell. Checking off the days and hours and minutes until they're taken out and hanged. Wouldn't it be a glorious day for Chicago? Wouldn't it be a glorious triumph for the state's attorney? Wouldn't it be a glorious triumph for justice in this land? Wouldn't it be a glorious illustration of Christianity and kindness and charity? I can picture them waking to the gray light of morning, furnished the suit of clothes by the state, led to the scaffold, their feet tied, black caps drawn over their heads, stood on a trap door, the hangman pressing a spring so that it gives way under them. I could see them fall through the space and stopped by the ropes around their necks. My God, if that doesn't like send a little bit of a chill down you, it's like history speaking to you. There's a reason the other, I admire this man. The other wonderful thing is that, um, Somebody, somebody in the chat made this comment, just noting the, uh, like, Darrow comes in with this speech prepared, but there's no way the prosecutor had an eight-hour speech, like, sentencing submissions prepared. I don't think he would have had any sentencing submissions prepared. He's just got to wing it. And you listen to that, and you got to follow that in, in response? And you got to follow that from off the cuff that you've been writing oh. while he's talking. Like, oh, man. And it's it's the delivery because he's not, you know, you see lawyers in their closing arguments get really dramatic. They wave their hands and they do all of this stuff and they elevate their voice and they don't. Clarence Darrow is, a, I, I, a, I, he's a role model. I love watching and listening to his arguments because he taught me the value of the pause, the value of taking your words carefully, methodically, conveying them and spacing them out as to give significant impact to each word without elevating your voice. The inflection the cadence, and then when you read the words he wrote, it matches him perfectly. So, yeah. The sentencing. Surprise, surprise. Judge Caverly, not swayed by the death threat, sentences Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb to life in Joliet Penitentiary. But that wasn't really the ending to the story. <clears throat> Nathan Leopold was released in 1958. He had educated himself even further in, uh, in the penitentiary, had offered assistance to third parties who were outside of it. For what we observed, he, he really did a lot to better his life and those in the community. Moved to Puerto Rico, married, and passed away August 30th of 1971. 
he had actually he had I think he had volunteered for drug treatments that were um, not medically approved. But conversely, Richard Loeb. Richard Loeb met a less than friendly death. He was killed in 1936, just years after his conviction, by a fellow inmate, James Day. Now, the facts surrounding this particular killing in, in custody are disputed. There is one narrative that Richard Loeb approached Day um, and that that approach involved an exchange of sexual favors and that Day uh, had kind of planned that he would use that opportunity to kill Richard uh, Loeb in the showers after locking the doors um, with a knife. We don't know what's true or not. That's the narrative that I see the most of. Um, but James Day uh, was later acquitted of that killing of Richard Loeb by a jury. And that's, uh, that is James Day depicted in the photograph there. So, Ian, <laughs> big part about this trial. Well, what's your favorite part about this story? I really like that this is the illustration of how the whole perfect crime thing is perfect crap. Because you've got these guys who are really smart and they plan the heck out of this. But by the time it actually gets implemented, it ends up being yakety sex. And that happens all the time. The perfect crime actually tends to be the really like the ones that don't get solved are actually usually the ones that make no sense whatsoever that have no cover up because the cover up itself is just generating extra evidence against, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So the ones that don't get solved are like two guys end up at a bus stop together for no particular reason. And one guy says something like, Hey, can I borrow a cigarette? And the first guy takes offense to that for no reason whatsoever. Bludgeons him to death, like drags him into the bushes and then gets on the bus. And like that sort of thing gets, um, you know, that sometimes just gets never solved. Yeah. Like, um, you know, these kinds of just random killings just sometimes um, never gets like two drug dealers run into each other on the street. One pulls a handgun, shoots the other and walks away. Often just never gets solved. But the people who think that they can create this elaborate plan are almost guaranteed to get convicted. And I kind of think that that's... Um, that's kind of a strength of our system in some ways um, that we're, we're pretty good at catching these people who are um, who think that they're clever, like cleverer than the system. One mistake is enough to get you. And these guys made several, but like the glasses, that's enough, right? Right there. It's enough. Even if all the other mistakes that they had made, they hadn't made, the glasses was enough and they're done. Yep. And I think the ve the vehicle was enough. The vehicle is enough. Um, maybe the, the typewriter, typewriter the typewriter enough. is enough. Yeah. I was there too. It's, um, and so you get this situation of just like, well, you never can know you're going to get away with it. So maybe don't do it. Um, maybe just leave that kid alone. My favorite part. So the story itself is, and this is one of these trials that I love talking about because I get the story and I get the sensationalism of these two young, affluent, high intellect individuals that just do the dumbest thing ever. My favorite part of this trial is that that 11th hour 
plea, that legal maneuvering, setting up an eight and a half hour closing argument and depriving the state of all of that spiking the football because that's what the state was intending to do. And that's why when I call this trial of century, no, it's not a trial, but is it worthy of the title? Absolutely. The state had positioned themselves to get a slam dunk conviction and were going for the death penalty full bore positioning the media. They had the witnesses they blocked the experts for the defense. They did everything to force this trial in one direction. And Clarence Darrow walks in and says, nope, reminder, I'm Clarence Darrow. Well, I also just kind of like the aspect of these two committed the most heinous crime imaginable. And one of them gets released afterwards. Yeah. And what does he do? Moves to Puerto Rico and does F all. Like he just lives out his... Our notions about crime and punishment are in a lot of cases just... Wrong. Wrong. <laughs> like... Wrong. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that surprises people is that murder actually is one of the crimes with the lowest rate of recidivism. And one of the crimes with the highest rate of recidivism is break and enter. People who break into houses when released tend to break into houses again. Um, it's it's weird. Because when there's not a human impact. Now, here's the thing. In the immediate aftermath, after their confessions, both boys were rather unapologetic about their actions. They were boys. It's not forgiving or explaining or rationalizing their behavior. It's irrational at its core. It's cruel at its core. They did one of the most disgusting and heinous things that could ever be done on this world. But is it the right of the body politic to play life for a life? And if I could, because the chat has inquired, <laughs> it would take a litigator such as Clarence Darrow himself with appropriately timed pauses and inflection, not raising his voice, but conveying to a judge, to a jurist of significant stature the impact that it conveys to a society of what lesson we are giving by feeding bloodlust. These boys engaged in what you could call bloodlust. I mean, they, they sought out a victim. But does that then give us, as the individuals judging their guilt or innocence and conveying a sentence, does that give us the right to engage in that very same bloodlust. No, it does not. And the other thing about that is the consequence of society getting that decision wrong is so much more significant. I've got to say, if I was in ancient Virginia, I would be going nuts just being like, hurry the F up. I know. Isn't that great? <laughs> so that came, so I'm just like... Oh my somebody it like trying to crazy. order a somebody trying to order a hamburger, you'd just be like, ah, this is gonna take me all day. <laughs> have I told you my favorite move in closing arguments? Um, uh, my favorite move is when I have a judge that I think isn't isn't really listening. I will take an abnormally long pause without any noise whatsoever until the judge looks up out of discomfort. The um so one lawyer and this, I wish this was my story because it's, it's beautiful, but a lawyer was telling me this story with this one judge who basically convicted everybody who came in front of his court. Like he was the hangingest of hanging judges. Like just like he wanted to convict everybody. 
And so one of the issues was whether or not there was a delay in allowing this guy to reach his, to contact counsel. And so the, like the lawyer made him play the tape, like made the court play the tape of this guy stuck in his set, like of the cell block video, this guy sitting in his cell. And he's like, we're going to play this at real time. And it was a 45 minute video of this guy sitting in cells. And oh. he's like, we're going to watch all 45 minutes, but a and then brilliant you're going to tell, and then you're going to tell me that it's not a, um, you know, and by the time, like, and the judge is like, no, we're not watching this at full speed, like at normal speed. And he's like, oh, do you want to? Appeal? You have to. Because I will appeal it and you will lose yeah. on appeal. Guaranteed. It, it's absolutely an appealable issue otherwise. So the judge eventually has to back down and let the guy play the tape. And by about 20 minutes in, he's looking at the prosecution going. Do you still want to continue with this trial? Yep. Yep. And eventually the prosecution is like, right, the judge is pissed at at me now because he's realizing how long 45 minutes really is. And he like he was that he won the trial and I'm going that that's brilliant. Um it it, it, it cuz <laughs> This is one of the criticisms I get as a litigator a lot. One of the biggest criticisms of my style is that when I start a case, when I give my opening statements, I am flying at a mile a minute. For those of you who have heard me on YouTube, you will hear me <laughs> at the beginning of these live streams or some way, and I'm just going a million miles an hour speaking at intelligible um, cadence. That I, I I don't like that. But then when I get comfortable, when I get into the comfort zone of where I'm talking about something that means something to me, my cadence will dramatically slow. Now, people have criticized this style, but I've actually come to view it as an asset. So when I'm going a million miles a second, the judges I appear in front of know that about me, but I also apologize for it. And I tell them to tell me to slow down. And I do. But when I slow my cadence down, the judge, who I've now, I don't mean to say trained, but it's just like a jury. You train the jury, you train the individuals around you. It's, it's a thing that you pick up. Yeah. When I slow my cadence down, the individuals that are listening have now realized that we have entered territory that I feel to be very significant. And they perk up. Now and is important pause, time, folks. Exactly. And if I pause and I come to a, a distinct and very long pause, to the point where it's uncomfortable and now you're looking up at me, you know that I have, I am demanding your attention in that moment. I know a prosecutor who said that uh, he had to fight a mistrial application because uh, he's making his closing arguments and he could tell that the jury was kind of fading, right? They'd been at this for like three weeks on a murder trial. You know, they're just starting to like, they're losing it. And he's sitting there and he's talking about a shooting. And so he's like, and then all of a sudden, and he picked up his heavy textbook, his heavy. Oh, tell like, me he drops it. He slams it on the table and just bang through the courtroom. God, I love that move. And everybody sits up and they're like, um, what is that? Um, and the other side was like, uh, we'd like to seek a mistrial. And they actually had to argue over whether or not the slamming of that uh, book yeah. down was a mistrial. I would move and for a mistrial. So would you. The judge was like, I don't really see a mistrial here, but I'll hear the arguments. And he's like, it's a rhetorical device. Like, I'm going to allow it. You can respond to it yourself. Um, so, yeah. So that's, for me, that's what, that's what this trial was. The closing argument for all ages. And it was one of the first times we saw mental health really enter trials at a very, very, very fundamental level in the entire like case. Um, here are some of the references that we used. 
Uh, I wanted to make sure that we cited these. Uh, FamousTrials.com gave us some good information. Library collections at University of Maine, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, PBS, Stanford University, uh, and Crime Archives gave us a lot of the images themselves. Again, uh, Lady Draconis was the queen of the resources in this one. She was the um, the driving researcher in pulling all of this stuff together. I knew the facts of the case, but the images were something else. And when she found those and, and brought them to my attention, I was remarkably thrilled. So um, that's the slideshow. That's the trial. What do you guys think? And it, it's a truly epic trial. Really is cool. So let's catch up on some super chats. Kristen M96, which bot got to go to work today? Happy birthday to you, by the way. Uh, did it behave? Do you need a dedicated law office bot? No, the unicorn bot got to go to work today. And there was a spare, this juror badge that is on the unicorn bot over top of the Canadian tie that you made. So it's sitting on the bookshelf, but that's the bot that got to go to the office. John Common, question for you both. Do either of you have a story during a trial where you went down a rabbit hole you did not intend to go down? Every trial. That's my answer. Did you ever find yourself questioning a witness down a, a path you didn't expect? Oh, absolutely. Um, I've had I've had witnesses give me answers where I was just like, I did not expect to hear this. Um, and then I've had to just be like, okay, let's, ex let's do that. Yep. This um, is where we are now. We live here now. Yep. Um, I've had to ask the judge midway through my cross examination, um, to say like, um, I need, I need a break. Uh, I, I have to plan this. And, um, like I had one moment where I basically said, Hey, um, you know, this is what happened. And the, the witness said, yeah. And I went, um, can I have a half hour recess? And the judge said, you weren't expecting that answer. Were you? Mr. No. And I said, um, no, I was not. He said, okay, mm -hmm. we'll come back. Um, we're going to, he said like, it's 11 o'clock. We're just going to take an early lunch and, um, we can come back. We've, you might also want to talk to the crown and, we've uh, seen the that crown in trials we've covered. Yeah. We, well, you and I have seen that in trials we've covered where like an attorney is asking a question and the witness answers. And then you were like, you and I are both looking at each other going, oh, not the answer they expected. Well, I actually, I did a whole video on, I actually thought this is one of the moments that Elaine Bredehoff did masterfully. Yes, and I'm not going to give her that. a whole lot of points for that, for, you know, for her litigation. But there was a moment where it was very clear to me and to you and to others who've litigated. It was like she asked a question of Amber. Yep. And she was expecting a particular answer. Right. She was expecting mm -hmm. to get a specific response. And she got a different answer. And she goes, she starts to answer the question. She goes, um, and then she re like, she answers a new question and it was like a half second pause and you couldn't, everybody catch it. It was so good. Everybody who doesn't litigate missed it. And I was like, I've been there. <laughs> like when your witness suddenly does a thing and you're just like, Oh, sh oh. and yep. If Howard want, Hunter did it. Howard Hunter did it in the Maya trial too. There was a moment where he goes, he pauses, and I was like, oh no, that wasn't, he didn't expect that. That was that was different. <laughs> and um I I've had this moment where like, and it's don't ever do this to your um uh don't ever do this to your defense lawyer, uh, where you come up with a new story on day of trial yeah. because um it um, it absolutely screws your defense lawyer, and screwing your defense lawyer is the worst thing you want because they're 
on your side. Like that's you. Yeah. Um, and in fact, it's you to the extent that when I, as defense counsel, say, um, you know, it's submitted that this is an un, you know, an illegal search, they'll be like. The you know, Mr. Jim Bob or whoever the accused name is, uh, submits that this is the thing because I am you in that moment, right? I am your representative, I'm you. So if you've screwed me over, that's but I've had moments where I was like, um, I had a case that was a beautiful self defense case, I was totally winnable right up until my client, when he got there, wanted to deny that he was being a jerk mm -hmm. and suddenly decided that he was present, like he wanted to present this view of himself that was, he is the most sainted ever person. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, this was totally winnable when it was two jerk asses arguing, like getting into a, a beaking off match. But once my client, you know, I was like, so how many drinks did you had? And he says zero. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> like my like, mentally like, I'm going judge. I would like five minutes with my client. And if I can borrow your gavel for a second, please. <laughs> Cause I mean, just, um, yep. Caught you off know, well, I'm sitting there trying to explain, okay, my client has, been at the bar for three hours and he said he's had zero drinks that makes sense right you know and i'm like all right now here's our you know here's our story i guess you know and there is an obligation when you think like or sorry when you know your client is lying not when you think not when you suspect but when you know your client is lying you have an yeah. obligation the problem is, is that in most cases, you can be, I think my client is lying. I strongly believe my client is lying, but not to that ethical point of, I know my client is lying. Correct. Because I don't know which is the true story. It might be that he's been lying to me in his, in my office for however long. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I have had to do the, you know, but it's just like, and then what happens, sir? <laughs> it's like, mm. so yeah, I mean, trial yep. strategy is, is tough. It it's, is. Uh, you can tell Ian has his, he's recovering rapidly. You know how <laughs> you can tell that? The frequency, and I love, I will, I will sit down with Ian and a beer and a glass of wine, bottle of wine. Oh man, that's go gotta happen. <laughs> nine million stories happily when I don't have to wake up in the morning. Um, no, Ian's a remarkable friend and he's always been there for me. And I cannot wait to see him next time in the future. Vez says from Quebec, Vez from Quebec, here I am wanting to go to bed early and still here. And enjoying myself. You guys are bad and I love it. Yep. Blame me and, <laughs> and me. Uh, Nick Loss quoting Mike Tyson. Everyone has a plan till they get punched in the face. Mike Tyson. Yep. That's pretty much true. Mark Twain. Great quote. Carla Vieira. Mark Twain. The right word may be effective, but no word was ever as effective as a rightly timed pause. Mm -hmm. Or Very. a rightly timed punch. <laughs> <laughs> probably also true cb this is why i study latin rhetoric is beautiful thank you cb Lindsay. question about the robot jury union wouldn't nightbot be the most logical candidate for the union leadership no nightbot's too rigid i can't negotiate with nightbot neither can the chat q reverie i remember your very first crack at this been a minute it has been a little bit of a time casey cat dang it congrats on the gundy noms too ian Oh, well, and thank Casey you. Casey Cat uh, again. Cheers to Ian being back to 60%. Hope you're back to 100% soon. I've got uh, I've got videos I'm behind on. I got so much stuff to do. Also, I just owe my wife some time cuz I've been out hunting. I've been all of this. Did you get your it's moose? like I did not I got nothing. I got absolutely skunked. Um absolutely skunked. 
Um, I have not folded a single tag, and it's sad because um, season end is in tomorrow days, and I can tell you, I'm just not gonna, I'm not gonna make it don't out. Do it. So don't get yourself sick because you'll get more oh, sick doing that. I'm I'm not gonna make it out. It's just like I've got nothing this season, and uh, it's sad because I had like all the tags. So, um, no deer, no, uh, no moose, no anything or no elk. Um, none of that. So yep. I just out of luck. It happens. But, um, um, yeah. X C D A. Thank you. I forgot how much I love these. Thank you very much for the kids. These streams, these streams bring me so much joy. Lawner for life. I love it. Gina D says, my birthday is tomorrow. Say it in your special voice. Gina D, I hope you have the most wonderful, wonderful birthday that ever did exist. Enjoy the time. Spend it in warmth with friends and family. Cheers to you, my friend. And may you have a wonderful next year of life. Billy's Momzilla, what was the average college graduate age in 1924? I don't actually know that fact. That's a good question, though. Uh, that is a good Tim question. Riggs. The 1920s were replete with pseudosciences all branching out from either Freud or Darwin. Neither all of them, uh, nearly all of them, completely failed any scrutiny. That's a, a fair assessment. Nick Loss says astrology or tool mark analysis. Yeah, but with typewriters, a little different. Uh, Tim Riggs' phrenology was no better than astrology. Criticism fair. Chris and I say Celine Accurate. is now on squirrel count. She was. Uh, John Common, TOTC recommendation. You guys bring on legal vices. We already, I've talked about this. He's coming on for that. We just have to oh, arrange yeah. it for the Titanic hearings and compare if they are parallels to Ocean Gate. We're talking about that. That's going to happen. Vez says, I may not be here till the end. Well, you were uh, teaching in the morning, but so happy to see you both. And I'm all for union of the bots. <laughs> uh, Sarah Turner, looking forward to this, guys. Glad to see you too, compadres. Thank you. Carla Vieira, that's are Canadian trial lawyers adversarial or do they just employ Canadian geese? <laughs> Canadians. It is an adversarial system here in Canada. Although uh, one thing that's really pleasant about criminal law is that criminal law is a very collegial adversarial system. So it is, it, it is I, for the most part. I'll go in and I'll have like one of my really good friends is um, a guy a, who was a crown prosecutor at the time. And we had a trial and we were just throwing down like it was an epic battle. I'm listening, but give me one sec. Oh, yeah. And we, you know, we were just at each other like, you know, my friend is making an argument that is quite frankly ridiculous. This kind of stuff. Right. And um, we're just we're just throwing down. But afterwards, we're like, want to grab a beer? Yeah, let's grab a beer. And so we just we just had a good time, right? And um it um even and then the next day we were back to it, right? We we're just like, all right, let's 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 go. So it's really nice when you can be in a place where you're just like, all right, we're gonna have this um this kind of um friendly discussion, this kind of friendly debate. So, um, yeah, that's, um, kind of my feelings on that. Um, civil law, what I've had to deal with it has been miserable, but, um, that's, that's its own story. Um, I am back. Sorry. Oh, no worries. A second. Human body things. Um, Island, thanks for asking me to research this for you. It was super interesting. I want to kind of make a point. Um, it's a caveat. I don't ever really ask anything of anybody. I don't want to because I don't want to expect anything of everybody or anybody. Um, I know that people offer to do research. A lot of them very generously donate time, effort. My email inbox is full of research materials, etc. cetera. I, I do have to give credit in this particular case to Christina, Lady Draconis, because I do she offered to make the slide deck in this case. And I know that Island has done research in the past and has, has sent me a number of things that I have used in the past. Um, and I know that she does a lot of stuff in contributing to the chat as a whole. 
but I don't ever really want to ask anything of anybody that's watching this channel. Really, I'd never want to have that expectation of any of you. I know that a lot of you are willing. And I know a lot of you are very generous with your time. So I thank all of you for being here and for that generosity. But tonight, I do want to highlight Lady Draconis because that slide deck was extremely well put together and it took a lot of effort and it took a lot of hounding me to get on the uh, uh, video chat to work through the slides and make sure they were in order. Um, and I know she was nervous about it and I, I'm very much go with the flow. So is Ian like I'll, I'll wing it. Don't worry about it. I'll wing it. That wasn't enough. Um, so yeah, I did. And shout out to mischief manager for designing the slides. Manage mischief managed. Ryan Man YYC, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. Truer words have never been stated. I love pie. Good luck in the Gundies, Ian. Uh, CB, I'll fully send you this trial of Socrates info. Some of it is that when you guys send all that stuff, I can't digest all of it. It's not possible. The number of emails. That's also why I don't want to ask you to do it. Ian gets a lot. I get a lot. I have a full-time practice. It's not possible to manage all this information at one time. So I very much appreciate um, everybody who contributes to the content on this channel. I very much appreciate my very good friend, Ian, who donates his time and effort and energy. And I love hanging out with him and talking with him about this stuff. And I hope to see uh, the tie very shortly. <laughs> I mean, the tie's there. I do see the tie. It's matching. Look at that. And then your tie's back there. So, um, all right. I think that's going to be a wrap for us tonight. So I think it's been a really good show. I love this. This is fun. This is fun. I remember I missed this. So mods, oh, thank absolutely. you for the great work you've done. Thank you all. Like, honestly, awesome. Chat was great. Ian, do you have a case next? Lady Drake is asking. I don't know. I'm kind of thinking we haven't done the Nuremberg trials. Ooh. Oh, and I okay. don't know if that's, that might be but too no, heavy. Buttercup. I think we can do it. We can do it. I, I feel like the Nuremberg trials is a trial of the century. It is. You know, it is. We can do it. Yeah. I mean, it's going to require a little bit of care, but I kind of feel like we should. Um, I kind of feel we like do we it. got it. Let's him. do it. You know yeah. what? Let's do it. Great idea, Ian. Let's do it. And we'll so, approach it. We'll approach it carefully. We'll make sure that we're planned in our analysis. We're, trust me, we got it. We yeah, got it. I mean, of all the trials, like it's the one people cite to a lot still. Wow. Um, and we don't and, know a lot about it. Like a lot of people don't know about it. Well, and plus, if you're in the military, any military, um, the Nuremberg trials really changed the rules because mm -hmm. they basically said, hey, um, you're going to be accountable for what you do, no matter like. So, yeah, that um, it's heavy, but I, I think we can do it. I think we can do it without, um, you know. Without getting into, I mean, it's going to be ugly, but, you know, we, we got it. I think we got it. Um, we got it. We're we'll, going to do it. So I like this idea. Well, it's a big undertaking, but I, I trust you enough. I trust you. You trust me. We're going to handle this. We got it. So uh, Peggy Reardon, did you get to hear Judge Newman with Murdoch the other day? Love Southern accent and cadence. We'll miss him. I did like his accent. He was a very, he was gentlemanly indeed. Uh, very much respected him. Um, all right. So that's about it for this evening. Ian, what do you got coming up next on the channel? Besides being uh, back to the channel. Well, uh, I'm going to be, I got to make a video to push for the Gundy's thing. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm going to be talking about how um, in Canada, they're looking to ban magazines with more than five rounds. So we're going to talk about just how much of a disaster five? that's going to be. Five? Five. Yep. Uh, we're going to talk about... Um, 
I've got a discussion about how the police have basically, and this is, I've got the video recorded. I didn't want to put it out today because the by the time I realized, hey, I should put this live, it was 15 minutes till showtime. And I was like, that's not a good idea. <laughs> so that'll be coming out tomorrow. The video will be coming out tomorrow of the, uh, of a police force that basically mm -hmm. brags about their, um, about how they're going to violate people's rights and how they don't understand the law. So that's going to be fun. Um, and then shortly after that, I'm going to be going off to, um, going off to Texas. I hate you. <laughs> I, I know. Um, so I'm going to be, you know, trying all the guns and, um, I'll have to do a video about that because, um, it's going to be fun. So, um, I hate you so much. <laughs> My jealousy is abounding. Um, oh, and I've got a, a thing to show you, but I can't show it on on live. So we'll have fair. to. Uh, it's it's probably one of the things that will get the YouTube like yeeted, like we'll eat the stream. No, it's one of those things where it's like, um, not the Internet is not ready for this yet. Likewise, fair, fair, fair <laughs> statement. OK, all right. Uh to all of you, um, keep an eye out for Friday Night Frenzy. We are going to be back to the Frenzy this particular Friday. So uh, I still have to look for different stories I want to cover. Um, so Friday I'll be live. I'm sure Ian will be live this coming Monday. Um, back to regular programming as usual. Thank you guys for being here. Ian, you okay if I go out with the uh, the LNL outro, the, the pen? Oh, absolutely. Yep. All right. So um, we will catch you next time in the interim. Go make something, whether it's writing, drawing, um, crafting, knitting, stitching, uh, crocheting, gunsmithing, uh, woodworking, metalworking, leatherworking. What have I, what have I missed out on? Any number of things. Go make something. Use that part of your brain. It'll make you feel better. Have a good evening. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Ian and I wish you the best. Cheers to all of you and good night. <laughs>